falhas técnicas, né? essa internet da Unifesp é, realmente dá alguns problemas, nós tivemos uns agora, então nós estamos começando um pouco, um pouco atrasados, mas pelo menos vamos começar. Né? Eu estou fazendo essa introdução em português para deixar claro que ah, o planejamento era para ser começado essa aula às 9 horas e nós vamos ter então o início do Intensive Course do Epidemiology, um foco em longitudinal studies, um curso que vai ser dado pelo professor Eduardo Simões, que é Distinguished Professor do Departamento de Health Management and Informatics da School of Medicine da University of Missouri. Uh, a long-term partner uh, in research, and he's going to be with us this whole week in the mornings. We're going to have morning sessions today, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and a wrap-up session on Friday morning. Uh, the afternoons will be reserved for uh, guided reading. You receive a list of references that you should get acquainted so you can better follow uh, the course. And, um, and also, you're going to be available here to personal contacts if necessary, if people can come here during the afternoon so we can discuss other matters, okay? Um, I'm going to give the word, give the microphone to Professor Eduardo so he should start his lecture today. Bom dia a todos, eu me sinto como um crooner de festa de 15 anos esse microfone na mão e com esse paletó aqui, um calor do café. Mas <risos> o curso vai ter que ser dado em inglês, mas é evidente que eu poderia ter dado em português, mas é um requerimento e eu moro na América há 35 anos, não tenho problema nenhum com a língua, mas eu tenho aquele famoso acento de inglês de nordestino, então vai ser muito interessante, então eu estou ouvido. Então vamos começar. Primeiro, o curso é um curso intensivo, não dava um curso intensivo para a gente se aprofundar em certas coisas, mas eu vou me aprofundar em algumas, tá certo? Qual é a finalidade do curso? É dar a vocês uma maior base ah, de conhecimento metodológico de como se implementar estudos observacionais e de ah, intervenções, tá certo? De tal maneira que você fique apto a analisá-lo, a desenhar o estudo melhor, a fazer análises mais complexas, entender por que você está fazendo aquela escolha. Agora em inglês. So, the objective of the course is to give an overview of observational design with focus on longitudinal perspective of studying associations between exposures, applicative risk factors or behaviors or whatever, and the outcomes calling health. In this case, but could be also diseases. Okay, usually the interest is say what causes that disease and how can we prevent. So the goal of the the whole program is to allow you to become most uh, acquainted with the methodological decisions that you need to make. The methodological decisions you need to make are related to designs of the study, are related to the analytical work you're going to implement, and how to actually implement them. There are many softwares over the past 50 years that allow you to do complex statistics uh, without thinking. But I don't want you to not think. I want you to think. And therefore, that's the course purpose. Okay? So let's give a little bit of an overview, which I gave you overall. So we're going to focus today on the observational study. It's impossible to speak about longitudinal observational design without speaking of the other type of design. You need to understand then a little bit overall. And then we're going to focus on the cohort study, which is the real longitudinal study. I want you to understand better. I want you to understand the perspective from a scientific standpoint, why I do the cohort design this way. And why do I need to analyze our data with a Poisson regression or a negative binomial regression? You, I want you to understand why you're making that decision. You don't need the statistician to do that. You need to do that as an epidemiologist. However, you need the statistician to be responsible for a variance that you could not estimate because he knows mathematical statistics and he can prove what's the origin of that variance for you. But you need to understand why you're asking this design, why you think the approach analytics should be A, B, or C. Okay, that's the purpose of this course. After looking to uh, the observational design, we'll focus on cohort, which will be the last one I'll present today. 
We're going to look tomorrow uh, a little bit already on intervention studies. And then uh, we cover intervention studies maybe over a day and a half because I only have um, about uh, four hours with you. Starting at nine o'clock, we finish at about, um, you know, with a break. I'll give you a break because there's a lot of material. And that means we're going to have about nine lectures. Um, lots of material for you to read. I want you to take the time in the afternoon to read it and you can ask questions. Send a question to um, an email I'm going to give you or through the system. I don't know how the university set up the system for you. Then we end up the last piece. It's about systematic reviews, the meta analysis, which pulled it all together. Okay, there's methodological approach to do that. And we're going to show you, we're going to show some of the mathematics of it too. But I don't want you to worry about mathematics. Ideally, this course should be given an intensive course, a whole day with exercise homework for you to do at home in a final exam. Not going to have that, which is good for you, right? But maybe not. Okay. So without further uh, delay, let's start the, the, the lectures. Uh, I want you to, um, to let me know. Um, and those who are organizing this course through emails or through message system, whether you're you're getting me right in terms of sound, in terms of image. Yeah. Um, I'll change it. Don't worry. Here, I have to stop sharing. Oh, and then I share again. Uh, measure of occurrence. We'll go to measure of this, this one. Yeah. And here we are. Okay, folks. So let's give it a review. So the first three hours are going to be a general review for some of you, but maybe not. We're going to get a little bit into some deep issues, but not too much. Okay. By tomorrow, we really, really need to cover all those deep issues methodologically. So we're talking about the statistical foundations. Why a relative risk is what it is, a relative risk. So let's start with measurement. Very basic review of the, the so-called measurements in epidemiology. Okay, and by the way, this little one here shouldn't have raised the postdoc salary issue. Because I know many of you are postdoc. Um, in a faculty meeting, when somebody raised postdoc salary issue in America, it's, it's really trouble. That means, hey, postdocs should make as much as assistant professor, shouldn't they? If they do the same work, they deliver the same thing, but we pay them shoddy salaries. That's that's a whole thing about the charge. It may not make sense here in America, in Brazil, but makes a lot of sense over there. It's, it's the same as having uh, football players in American football at the university. They're students, they're getting scholarship not to pay. The analogy is that. And because they don't pay, that's all we pay them. But then the university brings millions of dollars because of those players. So someone there smartly about seven, eight years ago said, hey, I'm the star here. You make it $100 million a year with me at university. All you give me is like a free B with a course that's half paid by the state. No, I want a salary. That's the same idea here for postdoc. Doc. I don't know how do they pay. Do they, do they pay here for postdoc? Yeah, scholarship. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, that's the ghost thing. And we're just saying, go ahead. We say, if you do that again, I'll stop this course. Okay? Don't do that. Not with me. Okay? Quick review. We're going to look into prevalence rate because I'm going to show something very important later on. That's why you need to look into prevalence rate, which is not a rate. Not a rate. And remember, the rate has to have velocity. The velocity has to have a measure of time. And the denominator is time. Elevated to the minus one. Remember that? So it's not a rate, but every them by call prevalence rate. Boom. Well, cumulative incidence rate, which is kind of, you can call, but it's not really a rate. It's a probability. It doesn't have time. It doesn't have even dimension. It's dimensionless. And then we're going to go to uh, incidence density. We're going to look in quickly to survival. They're all related. The survival of one minus the risk. You're talking about the person who's already sick, you're waiting until they die or continue to survive. And then you have case fatality rate, odds ratio, other rate, just to mention. We're going to go deep into that after this lecture. Indicates the number, that's the prevalence or frequency of existing cases in a population. Prevalence rate is equal to one. Usually you estimate the prevalence 
when you have um, a cross-sectional study. What is a cross-sectional study? This is a survey. Anytime you sample something randomly as a survey, you have measures of prevalence in your hand. Let's say you want to sample records in the hospital. Okay, if you have 1.3 million records and you sample randomly 200 of those records, that's a sample, right? That survey, a proportion, whatever you're trying to estimate, I want to see out of those 200 patients, how many are smokers? So how many are smokers divided by the total numerator, that's 200, that's your prevalence estimate. Okay, let's say there are uh, out of 200, there's like, you know, 40 who are smokers. So it's 40 divided by 200, that's 20%. That's your prevalence rate of smoking among hospitalized patients who have a medical record in that system. If you go and say, hey, I'm going to find out if people eat fruits and vegetables in Brazil, and I helped Brazil to do that about 17 years ago with the Minister of Health. We create a system that you use today called Vigitel. We're all involved in creating Vigitel here. Okay? It took me three years to develop with great people here, Dr. Monteiro from our university here in Sao Paulo. And so they already have the, the, the so-called basis of the Vigitel. What is a Vigitel? It's a cross-sectional study done throughout the year, every now and then, uh, in a week. I don't know how much the frequency, the model they use in America is the behavior risk factor surveillance system, which measure the prevalence, so to speak, in a whole year, because they collect data every day, every hour of the day, except after 11 o'clock, because people are going to try to kill them. If you call them your home, at 11 o'clock to ask you about your fruits and vegetables. But anyhow, so that's a survey. You're doing a survey, a telephone-based survey. You're taking people randomly from their household across America or across Brazil, and you ask them questions. Oh, how much of this you eat? How often do you eat? And so on and so forth. Then you create an indicator, which is the number of people who eat five or more fruits and vegetables a day. And then you divide that by the total number in your survey, that's your denominator, and that's your prevalence estimate, folks. It's not a rate, it's just a proportion. And this thing is going faster than I'm moving in. So I don't know how to stop that automatic thing. Maybe Freddie will help me in the next lecture. Yeah. Uh, now it's not moving. I went too far. Okay. So you have a point prevalence, superior prevalence. These are terms very much used everywhere. Just to distinguish between one prevalence that's measured over a period of time versus one that's measured at exactly one point in time, okay? And this is totally subjective. For me, a one year is a point in time because I'm looking at years. Why? Behaviors, the risk factor change longitudinally a long period of time. It don't change tomorrow or in two months or in six months. It changes every year, every other year. You see a little bit of change in the prevalence or the proportion. Do you have anything? You want to work here? Okay. Sorry, folks. So this is usual representation in a two by two table. Are you familiar with the term two by two table? Okay, so you have your table of exposure, the column indicate exposure of anything, let's say eating five fruits and vegetables a day. Okay? And the outcome, it's on horizontal. That's your health outcome. It could be, hey, how many people there have, um, have been told by a doctor they have diabetes? Type 2 diabetes, that is. So, Vey Vigitel does ask this question and ask the question about fruits and vegetables. So, you can cross tabulate the two. Okay? And say, okay, here I have how many people have eaten over the past year five or more fruits and vegetable days, and how many people have been diagnosed with diabetes who are such type. That's cell A. So, and then you get the same corollary for the other measurement. And then you have, you can calculate also by looking at the numbers like that, you can cross tabulate and calculate the prevalence ratio. Okay, and that you see the prevalence ratio. Prevalence in exposed group is A over N1. Prevalence in unexposed group is B over N2. We you divide one prevalence uh, in exposed by the prevalence of the unexposed, you got the prevalence ratio. And I've seen many people trying to write when you see association like that, they say, hey, I see that the people who have diabetes, they don't eat fruit and vegetables. level possible. 
because these two things are measured at the same time. In fact, if you actually analyze this prevalence data, I guarantee you in a Vigitel or BRFSS in US or the same one that they've done in Italy and France in Europe, they start mimicking the BRFSS everywhere in the world. China was the first BRFS outside US. We went there 27 years ago to teach them how to do that. Same way we came here and helped the Minister of Health to do the Vigitel for you for Brazil. And you cannot tell why. I'll tell you why. If you do this cross tab right now, you're going to see that people who eat five or more a day, other people have the worst chronic diseases. So is it telling me that if I do all the right things in terms of eating fruits and vegetables, exercising, eating low calorie, having a good body mass index, I will have diabetes? No, that's not what it's telling me. What happened is that two things are measured at the same time. And once you are being diagnosed with diabetes, you start changing your behavior immediately. You start eating well, start exercising a little bit too late, but you do. And therefore, it shows in your cross-section as the inverse association. You see how it's dangerous, prevalence data? Prevalence data is good, mostly in epidemiology, to tell what the size of the issue is, but not to stop this relationship, because this example just gave it to you. So I'm a diabetic person. I've been diagnosed with diabetes. I know a doctor told me, a nurse told me, everybody confirmed, and then my A1C is over 7. So I am diabetic. Guess what? 80% of diabetics, once they learn they are diabetic, they start changing their behavior. The exception, my twin brother, no. He said, no, I'm going to die early, but I want to eat well. I want to drink well. I want to do all those screwing things in life I can have my hands on. So his conscious is going to die happily earlier. He has diabetes, has hypertension, everything. We're identical twins. The only thing between us, different, is behavior. It's environment. He is 120 kilograms. I have 65 since I was 17. So what does that tell me about prevalence data? Be careful with prevalence data, but try to establish association. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to skip that. You can see that these lectures are yours. Don't copy that. I'm giving this to you. Everything I want Louise and the university to give it to everybody who enrolled in this study. I want you to have it. It's yours. And you can teach it freely. Everything I own belongs to the whole world, not to me. Risk. So what is risk? A measure of disease occurrence. But it's very different measure than prevalence. A prevalence, I go to have a cross-sectional study, right? I got a survey. I got a sample. I can go to a household. Okay, it's Villa Clementino here in Sao Paulo. I, I take a random sample of all households in the Villa Clementino, okay, a thousand people, and I create a group of people who have been sampled randomly, and now I have the denominator, a thousand people, right? All adults. And then I ask simple questions about longevity. That's what Liz does to create a cohort. So the baseline, uh, it looks like there's some technical issue. Many of you may not be listening. Is that okay? Continue. What? But, there's a blue screen there. That's a blue screen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's the... There we go. Okay, folks, I, po I apologize. It looks like I've been talking uh, to you, but at least you heard. Okay? Uh, but that's what I was talking about. It's two by two table. I hope I have not lost you after I mentioned the two by two table. Those few were here in the classroom and seeing it. So I got enthusiastic and went on until they told me technically this thing is not working. So you have the two by two table. Be careful with the associates, cross-sectional associations because they are not causal associations. They're just association. You can find the strength of that association for prevalence ratio, but never go and say, hey, the people who eat five or more a day are three times more likely than those who don't to develop diabetes. That's wrong statement. And they, they do it all the time. And when I see a paper review and they say, nah, nah, and I cross it and you'll never get accepted for publication from the editor there, okay? What you can say is that it appears that eating five fruit and vegetables is associated with diabetes. You don't tell which side because you don't know if it's going in favor or against developing diabetes. 
And the other thing you can say is that a prevalence ratio of those who eat five or more a day versus those who don't for developing diabetes is such, twice, 1.5. That's all it says, the, the magnitude of the difference. But not likelihood. Likelihood implies I will be more likely to. That's risk. Prevalence is not risk. It's a proportion like risk, but it's not. So let's go to risk. So risk is basically um, any time you have a situation, you have observed people over time, two people are more deserving over two weeks, or a thousand people I am following up for about five years. That's a cohort study that we did three times here in Sao Paulo in, in Clementino Village. Okay. So when I have that situation, any new case of anything that I'm interested in is an incident case. So a new case is an incident case. What is not a new case? What is not a new case? What is an old or existing case? Any case that started before the cohort period. Let's say your, your cohort started in January of 2022 and finishes in December of 2027. That's five years exactly. So January 1st, you establish your cohort, you sample everybody, bring them into the study. And then five years later on 31st December, of 2027, your cohort ends. If then this period, the outcome, health outcome, if you're interested, it could be a disease, it could be anything. It could be a change in functionality of a person. Going from, I will establish that my new case is gonna be a person that has an ADL, activity of daily living, that has a distant score on that, that still can be functional alone, becomes totally no function. So that transition I call new case of dysfunctionality. Okay, so over time, every time a new case like that shows up, because I'm measuring it every other month or every three months or every five months, whoop, that person is a new case, an incident case. The denominator of that baby here is all those people I'm following up who are not at risk at the beginning of the follow-up. That's a very important concept. If I'm dealing with infectious disease, that's critical, right? Because if I'm not risk of developing that disease, I should not be in the denominator. Let's say I'm interested in something that's vaccine preventable, not like COVID, <laughs> but some other disease. So if I have some other disease that is totally preventable vaccine, I have to eliminate from my denominator of the cohort, all the people have been vaccinated, okay? Because they are not at risk for developing and becoming a new case. So they should not count for denominator. So that usually you take care of that through an inclusion or exclusion criteria. We're gonna deal with that in a few minutes when you focus on the cohort study. So you have your new cases and you have the people in the denominator who started a follow-up period with me. I'm the researcher. And these people are all at risk-free, I mean, disease-free at some point and at risk for developing the condition. Then I have the condition to calculate in a year time a risk. So the risk is nothing more than the probability of developing some something over a period of time among those who are at risk for developing that something. You following that? Yeah. I wish I could have more interaction. I have four people here. Please, can you follow that, folks? Is that good? Good. Good, Maya. So the typical two-by-two two table, uh, you see again, it looks like the prevalence table, right? It's exactly the same prevalence table. What the heck? Why don't I call that one risk? No, 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 no. This is actually falling people up. Okay, and I'll show the exception of that. Why state epidemiologists in America or anywhere in the world, why the public health department calculate an instance rate? They're not following up everybody not in the state of Sao Paulo or in the city of Sao Paulo, but you call an instance rate that or an instance uh, criminality instance, which is the risk. Yes, I can. I'll show you why. That's the mathematics of rate and risk. They are related. They're cousins. Okay, but they're not the same thing. So, I can also do, I'm going to anticipate what I'm going to show you in, in the study design. I can also create groups of follow-up, exposed group, unexposed group. Once I have my cohort, I select people to my thousand people in Clementine and to be my cohort. I can designate at the start of that follow-up period a lot of people based on a lot of stuff I collect on them. I know someone there is still smoker at age 80 or 75. Let's say my cohort started at age 75, goes all the way to until they die which is in Sao Paulo, could be very long time. Very different than northeast of Brazil where I come from. If it's in the countryside of Pernambuco State, they'll be dying at 65. 
we have two different cuts, my friend. Okay. So here there'll be thy 90 in Sao Paulo and Clementino, and over there there'll be thy 65. So be aware of that longevity issue here. So once I have that cohort and I establish that at age 75, absolute majority don't smoke, but still have like 8% smokers. Well, I can create a group that all the people who are falling up were called smoker, that the exposed group, any one people such type. And I have the unexposed group, any two, two people of the same type. We're going to look into that later on. I can create two risks, the risk in exposed and the risk in unexposed. And once I divide one risk by the other, I have the contrast between those who are exposed to smoke and those who are not. Here's different than the prevalence. I know that smoking preceded the outcome because the outcome is a new case of the outcome. Let's say my outcome is ADL that changed from, what's the good ADL number? Zero to one. What's the bad one? That's not totally in there. 10. So if you go from zero to 10, you are a new case of bad ADL. That's your new case, right? That new case show up in my data, in my cross tabulation. After I told the people a year ago, six months ago, five years ago, three years ago, that they're already smokers and which smoker. So I have no doubt that smoke had preceded the outcome. Smoking is a behavior that preceded the outcome. So I can establish now, I can say, hey, the smokers here are twice more likely to develop a bad ADL over a five-year period than those who are not smokers. Then I can use the word more likely because the risk is a likelihood. It's a probability statement. It goes from zero to one. Dimensionless. It doesn't have any metric associated with it. Very similar to the prevalence. A prevalence is a form of probability, but not an association, association measure. It is a measure of magnitude that we use as a measure of association wrongly and very, very, very dangerous. Yeah, cause and effect. That's what uh, Luis is suggesting me to use, and he is a thousand percent right. It's better to say cause and effect. What I mean is real association is cause and effect. When I say just any association, I'm talking about prevalence. Uh, just for you not to be confused, there's something called attack rate. It's not a rate neither. Used everywhere else in the world, but all the epidemiologists, I never did. And CDC will tell me, that's 1995. Why don't you call attack rates? Because it's not a rate. But everybody here is CDC called because you're a dummy. Okay, it's not. It's not a rate. It's a risk. It's a proportion. Okay? So it's the same thing. It's just that we use an infectious disease because it's a short period of time. You know, Louise invited me tomorrow and everybody in his group to go to a party in his house. And he knows who came to his house. Well, maybe not. After two weeks, you'll forget everybody. <laughs> Let's say we talked to Luis a few hours after the party. He remembered who was there. Right, Luis? <laughs> so I know who came to my party. So I know everybody went there. And then, you know, everybody ate my food. I, I cater. I, I pay for a service to bring food in. Hey, 20% develop a diarrhea of their life. Okay, I can call those people who develop diarrhea, but those who came to the party, okay, one divided by the other, one measure divided by the other, as the attack rate or the risk of developing diarrhea going to Louise Park. Okay, that's an attack rate. And if I can interview these people and say, hey, everybody here, did you eat the, the potato salad, mayonnaise? And about, you know, about 30% of them they say, yeah, I did. Uh, uh, and out of the 30%, 70% developed diarrhea. Diarrhea. Those who didn't eat that thing, nobody developed diarrhea. Well, there's no case. It's always a crazy case like that. So I can stop now attack rate ratio. I have the rate or the risk of those who develop diarrhea who eat the potato salad mayonnaise divided by those who don't. It's that simple. Okay, we'll go over that later on. Secondary attack rate. Don't get confused. All risk, all proportions. You can read this. Okay, now the cream of la cream. The incidence density or the incidence rate. That's a true rate. It's the only rate in epidemiology. So, folks, that is very simple. If you understand three measures, prevalence, risk, and incidence rate, you know 100% epidemiology. But you need to understand them well, know how, how to measure them, how to collect data to form, form them. That's what I'm going to teach you in this course, and how to pl play with that. Okay? Why do I need a binomial regression? Why can I use a logistic regression to send? Yeah, I could. But if I can do a binomial Poisson on an instance rate, I'll better use a Poisson rate. 
And we're going to show you there are two measures there. There's the prevalence, the numerator, I mean, sorry, the incidence, the numerator, and there's the rate, which is the incidence divided by the percentile. We're going to talk about that now. So the incidence rate, like the risk, reflects new cases of occurrence of something. But the interpretation is very different. And the risk is the probability of developing something over a period of time among those who have been followed up by me, a researcher, who are at risk of developing that something over time from the beginning of the follow-up. That's the proportion. That's the risk. Here is different. Here, the incidence rate is going to tell me what's the velocity at which this new case occurrence is happening. And I'm going to show at the end of this lecture a simple case study I created for you based on the truth. It's actual data from a friend of mine who created a book about a medical epidemiology. Um, Dr. Ellis from Emory University. I was his student back uh, nearly 40 years ago. So he built that. And I'll, I'll bring the case study at the end. You can see how we can use prevalence, risk, and incidence rate in the same hospital. Many of you may be working in a hospital system and infectious disease. And a hospital is very important. I'm going to use infectious disease as an example. I'm using a lot of aging, and I will be using a lot of aging examples. By the way, Luis, I did not create case study on aging. I'm, training, I'm, I'm creating as I go along like I did today. I can create cases like hell like this. Don't worry about it. I'll bring a lot of them. So the incidence rate then becomes the, nu the numerator go out the same way as the risk, the new cases of developing the condition I'm interested in measuring, the outcome of my interest over time. That's new, that's in that case, out of those who are at risk at the beginning of the follow-up. Very similar to the risk. But the denominator, that's what the difference is. The denominator is personal time. So I'm basically saying I'm following up a thousand people. But not everybody's follow up over the same period of time because they create a cohort of five, five years. I may lose some people in five years, eight, 10 old people will die on average out of these 200. So I will lose them. So they can only contribute to the follow up observation period until they die, right? Once they're dead, I cannot follow them up. I'll give an example later on that I create a case control study with dead people. And people thought I was crazy. Even people say, you never be published, it cannot be your thesis. So I kicked the school, say, go to hell, and I publish in American Journal of Cardiology. But that's an exceptional case. Usually when you're dead, you're gone, right? You're gone for family, you're gone for life, you're gone for cohort study. So you're following up people up. Everybody contributes some time to the observation period, and that's the person time. So what are the people who are lost to follow up? So I ended up, I started with a thousand people at the beginning of the follow up period. And then a year later, I only have 950. I lost 50 people. Some died, one, two died. The other one just disappeared. People may disappear. Yes, they disappear. Okay. And some just say to me, I'm no longer part of the study. Go to hell. Now, I don't want to be there. So you lost that really to follow up because they don't want to be followed. But at least for the time you could observe them, you know they did not develop the, the outcome of interest. Or if they did, they, they didn't die of it or something similar. So you actually following up people and adding up everybody's person's time. It's that simple. So if I contribute, I'm a cohort member of the cohort study. Then I contributed only a year and six months. So my contribution to the follow-up denominator is 12 plus 6. is 18 months. And then somebody else contributes. Five years, 60 months. Somebody else will contribute to the end of the follow-up. Um, four years of that. That's 48 months and so on and so forth. When you add them up together, that's your denominator for the instance rate. So the denominator is a function of time. It's actually in days, in hours, hours, days, months, years, decades, whatever you want to use. If it's a follow-up period. Once you have that, you have your, again, your famous, if you're doing study, you have your favorite exposed and unexposed people. Because in a cohort study, I want to show you again and again that you start from the exposure. You expose, have people exposed and exposed, you follow them up to look at the outcome, when the outcome happened. Example here, 2010, man, you can read it about it, but you get the picture. After year one, there are 2,000 free, uh, disease-free people, zero with the condition I'm interested in, in, in following up. And 100 were lost to follow up. So I no longer have 2,100. At the end of one year, I only have 2,000 people to follow up. And that's how it happened. 
So hundreds are lost to follow up, but they contribute at least one year. So I have 100 person year for those who I lost, plus I still have 2,000 for the others. You with me? Follow that? And so on and so forth. So you end up with calculations like that. You have over time, over a period of time, you have, you know, 16 cases I tally. I tally 16 cases, new cases, incident cases of the disease. That's my numerator. And then I add up how much person time everybody contributed. It looks like in this made up cohort that I created 30 years ago to teach people management about epidemiology, that I only have three measurements over a period of time. So in the first time of measurement, maybe first year, I only have one case. Second year, I have seven cases. On the third year, I have eight cases. So I have 60 new cases of the disease among those who are at risk for becoming a case. Divided by the person time of all these cases. Okay. So you end up with 2.5 per 1,000 person years of observation. Or 2.5 by 1,000 years. You can play around with the scale, right? So the incidence rate, it, it's an interesting phenomenon because you can do something, and I'll show you mathematically why later on. For a large population, seriously, remember I mentioned public health folks? They, they claim they calculate an incidence rate. Are they right or are they wrong? I know in a cohort study, I can only calculate both. I can calculate the risk. I can calculate the incidence. If and only if I measure it. If you have a cohort that say, I, I, I have money to do a 10 years cohort, you only measure first time a baseline, only measure 10 years later, you don't know what happened between. So you cannot tell what the person time is. Even if you measure every year for 10 years, you have 10 measurements, right? Of the total population that how much they contribute to the person time. But if a person developed the condition, is lost to follow up or die. All I know is in that first year, they disappear. So do I give them 12 months of follow up? Do I give them one month? Do I give them six months? What do you think is the answer for those who are here? Because I cannot communicate with those who are outside. I'm not getting, you know, two image. But anybody? Should I give one year? If, I, if I'm following up for five or 10 years, and then after the first year, I lost 100 people out of 2,100. So they, they disappear from the cohort. Either because they develop the condition, they are out of the, the denominator, they are the new case, they die, they, they're dead, or they disappear. So do I give them one month of follow-up period for the first year, six months, or 12 months? What's the best solution? Six, I got six here. 12 months. Six. Six, six win, and that is the right answer. But many people do 12 because they say, hey, I'm making that middle, middle, minimum mistake for everybody else consistently. I'll do that until the end of the follow-up. So it's like I'm rescaling. Let's say that the truth is somewhere in between six months. It's more likely the truth, right? But I'm rescaling. I'm saying everybody's going to get 12 months. So I'm doing that for everybody. Only one problem. If the number of new cases is too frequent, if you have a situation that you have a lot of new cases relative to the size of the person time, it's not a good idea to give 12 months. But if it's very rare, it doesn't affect you, just rescaling. Okay? I'm not going to be able to show mathematically here, but I could, maybe. And let's not think about an example. So usually at the state level, that's not the, what I'm trying to show to you. What I was trying to say is that in a instance rate and a population of Sao Paulo, for instance, I can call instance rate the number of new cases divided by the total population of Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. If and only if I can say the population of Sao Paulo, on average, for most big cities in the world, they are homogeneous and stable from a demographic or epidemiology perspective. Those words in English actually mean this population, the number of people coming in and coming out is about the same. Number of dead coming out of that population, the number of new immigrants, how many people from Nordesh to Tashintraki is the same every year, right? So that means the population is stable, right? And it's homogeneous. I'm not dramatically shifting unless there's a war, okay? If there's a war, like in Bosnia or Ukraine or something like that, that changes the shift of the population. But usually big populations don't change, okay? And therefore, you would say the average size of the population at risk with everybody in Sao Paulo Multiply by the number of period of times that I'm observing. If it's one year, I multiply by one. That's my denominator. And I'm going to 
show you later on mathematically this is possible two integrals i'm going to show you how that's done come on it doesn't want to move hold on a second no 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 because it's probably here yeah it's one way or the other i was using the mouse but the other thing stuck and this one is work so again the population of for stable population uh large population like city of sao paulo state of sao paulo brazil uh, a province a whole climate you know you can extrapolate as the population gets smaller the approximation is not good if you say oh i'm going to use the approximation for my whole cohort i have a thousand people and i'm following them up five years i'm going to say everybody is one thousand every year that's what mean people do cohort coming out of many places i'm not going to mention the place that i really do. say no nah, you're wrong if that can only be done for large population and i'm going to show you all why mathematically so in this case, in Missouri, back in 1992, when I created this lecture for this the program, when I, I was the chair of the department for many, many years, 3,250 new cases of colorectal cancer occur in that year in Missouri. And the population of the state at that point was 5.2 million. So the crude incidence rate is 3,252 divided by the 192, 80, 41, because I say everybody contributed one year, okay? And I can read, scale that or look at that to say it's the same as saying 2.6 per 100,000 person years. For every 100,000 person years of observation and follow up, I will have 60 new, two new cases of cancer. And that's a very powerful measure for a measure, a measure of magnitude of the velocity at which cancers occur in the population. By the same token, the incidence rate back in 1992 for thyroid cancer was 0 0.1 per 100,000. So colorectal cancer was 62 times divided by 0 0.1. How much is that? How many times? 600 times, right? So you got it. And then there's something called survival. We may find a little, little time because I'm doing meta-analysis and I may need to look into some survival study, uh, either through uh, clap my type of survival functions or the true multivariate regression called Cox model, which is just a variation of exponential model. Okay, why well, about uh, statistics, I told you to speak. So survival is a proportion of the probability of remaining alive for a specified period of time. And following people up, I say I'm following up cancers, uh, patients who have leukemia, okay? And I have these people being treated with a new medication in hospital A. I have another group in hospital B that's taking the standard treatment. That's a new medication or standard treatment, traditional clinical trials. Well, I can calculate the surviving the two groups. Okay, all of them are leukemia patients. The my interest, the event of my interest is being alive or being dead after so many months or years of follow-up. Okay, so evidently probabilities risk goes from zero to one. Therefore, if I take one minus is that that's going to be those who survive right one minus 0 0.5 which 50 percent of the population die it's 0 0.5 surviving so again that's what we call a survival it's a very simple measure you may come up i just mentioned to you this is the example again you have i don't know if it's showing you no it's not you only seen here so it's a waste but for those who are in, huh? so you have the event of interest from person a developed the event in about four months four and a half, four or five months. Person B is right sensor. That's another term we use in accompanying patient over time. They are right sensoring. At the end of the follow-up period, if the follow-up period doesn't stop, I need to stop because I don't have money to continue, right? <laughs> My studies are stopped right there. And then the withdrawal, that's another way of right sensoring. There's another way of right sensoring called lost, which is not withdrawal. Withdrawal, the patient say, I'm out. There are some ethical issues. There are some other consideration. And loss is like, I really lost the guy. I don't know if they're alive, they're dead, they, they became a new case, I don't know. And then an X event. So I'm trying to prevent a good cohort study to lose people or withdraw because people who, lose, who lost or withdraw, it's bias. It's a selection bias, okay? Selection bias is a bias that comes, creeps into your study and based on the manner in which I select people into or out of the study. He is clearly out of the study. It's not coming in, it's going out. So it's creating a selection bias. I want you to read about a case fatality rate is another 
where it's a risk among those who already have a condition, kind of. It's the inverse of the survival. So if you say risk and survival are opposite, yes, but not risk in the general population. It's risk and survival of those already with a condition. And I'm looking to final event called death. If I'm looking to death, then it's survival and risk. And the risk now is called case fatality. Rate, wrong, it's just a proportion. What noise was that? Did you hear that? Yeah. Can you kick? A connection. Okay. Voltou. Okay. Tá aparecendo a imagem? Só o áudio, a imagem não. Ah. Nem a apresentação. Então, pessoal, estão com um problema técnico aqui, mas é segundo, eles vão resolver. Espera um pouco. Eles estão tentando puxar a imagem de volta. Ah? Tá só o áudio. Ah, a internet já voltou. Ah, que bom. A internet voltou, quer botar lá? Oh, fica aberto ou fica no teu mesmo? Ah, poxa, não, pelo menos está garantido. Está é, funcionando do jeito que está, a gente continuar como está. Continuar como está, com, através do celular do Fred. Certo? O salvador da pátria. Voltou, então, é, voltou só a apresentação e áudio, a imagem do professor. Não. É o Deconnect there? Não. A imagem dele não. Volta, volta para o... A câmera não. É Mas a câmera. apresentação é ótima, ok. Se quiser continuar, eu vou assim a câmera. Eu não sei se. Aqui está, now you're sharing. Ah, tá. Aqui está. Eu aquele blu blu. Acho que saiu tudo, né? Não, dá uma olhada. Dá uma olhada aí. Tá bom, tá bom, tá ótimo. Tá. É lá, não é? Mesmo. É, tá certo. É mesmo. É isso daqui. Isso. Então, pessoal, então a case fatality é o inverso da survival, tá certo? É uma forma de risco. E esses exemplos aqui, eu falei, eu quero que vocês leiam depois essa aula com calma, é muito básico, é só uma revisão, isso não é a parte que eu quero que vocês se adentrem. Mas já falei coisas profundas, que são conceitos... Que, ah, estou falando em português, cara. Se fosse em inglês, nem em inglês. Eles yeah, estão falando em português. Tá, tá. Yeah, I know. So this is a, a review of issues that people should know strongly. But over the years, I've been working with Luis for 30 years here, coming to Sao Paulo. How many courses I gave you in Sao Paulo? And this is, the, trust me, Sao Paulo and most of the South is the better part of education of Brazil. It's a fact. I came from Northeast and the level is lower there. There are some people who know a lot of epidemiology everywhere, but I'm, I'm talking about on average. But even here, over and over, I found people making mistakes about incidence rate, risk, and prevalence, and about the designs of those studies. And that's what we do in this course. We thought it was very important so we can get a strong foundation. So here you have the measures uh, that I mentioned, risk, prevalence, and incidence rate. I'm not mentioning survival in case fatality, which is very seldom used, but it is used, especially in clinical trial. We're going to deal with that on Wednesday, when I talk about intervention trials, clinical trial, randomized clinical trials are a form of intervention trial. Okay, so you have your risk, your prevalence, and incidence rate. You now know how they are different. The risk and the prevalence are two proportions, two probability statements. One probability statement is just saying this thing is happening. It doesn't say it's going to happen or is has a chance of happening. Just say this thing is happening. That's a prevalence. This thing is this size. It's a good measure of the magnitude of a health issue in the population. And that's why it's used in uh, cross-sectional studies or surveys. But I can do surveys of chairs. That's what they do in industrial field, okay? I can do surveys of seeds in agriculture. That's what they do, okay? So it's just a sample. And out of that sample, 
I know what my n of the sample is. The n is an estimation of the true n, which is the real size of anything in the real life. So I sample that. That's my little n. And out of that sample, I got the number of things that I'm interested in. That goes in the denominator. And the n becomes a denominator. That's your prevalence. It's just the size of the magnitude of a health issue. Now, when people start playing with that, and throwing one prevalence over another prevalence, oh, this prevalence of people who have these characteristics, say the prevalence of lung cancer. Okay, let's say Sir Dawn Hill in 1948 didn't do a cohort study. They did a prevalence study. And they went to the registries of all physicians in England and in Scotland at that point in Wales. Okay, and say, how many of these people have lung cancer? How many of them smoke? Okay, then he take the proportion of people who have the disease lung cancer who are smokers and divide that by the proportion of people who have lung cancer who are no smoker. He would have found, they, it's Dahl and Hill, two guys, he, they would have found a ratio that may resemble the risk ratio that they actually found later on in a cohort study. But it could have been extremely different. Why? Because I cannot establish causation with a prevalence ratio. We don't know what comes first. Am I seeing the phenomena one preceding the other? I don't know. I measure it at the same time. When I sample you in a sample, and I say, hey, uh, what's your body weight? And uh, she is a beautiful woman going to say to me, oh, I'm only uh, X kilogram. I know that's the close to the truth as possible. Add another two kilograms. And if I ask a man, what's your height? He's going to say, hey, I'm 184 centimeters. I know it's 182, 180, but he say 84 because men tend to bias the information higher for height and women tend to bias the information lower for weight. And I studied that 20 years ago in America. And I can prove it to you mathematically. But anyhow, that's a prevalence. It cannot establish. If I have these numbers and cor cor correlate that with outcomes, health outcomes, I cannot stop the causation. I'm over and over saying that. That's a very important concept, folks. I see it every day. Sometimes they don't say, oh, this takes cost, but they say it's more likely. In English, they write the abstracts and send to the publication there. I just reviewed two papers for a journal here in Brazil. And they said that. And I say, wrong. Not going to be published if you do insist on that. That was the second review, and the person keeps insisting. Okay, anyhow. So, risk is different. It's dimensionless, like prevalence. There's no dimension that. There's not metric. There's no... But it implies new diagnosed cases or new thing. It's an instance of a new thing. Over the period of observation, it's a new event. Those who had the previous... Um, how do we establish a prevalence in a cohort? If I bring to a cohort 100 people and 20 of them have the disease already, they are prevalent cases. They're not instant cases. Instant cases, people have to be at risk for that outcome. Over time, I follow them up and they develop the outcome. That's the instant case. But if they already have the case, they are not. And they will be removed from the denominator. Okay? So we're starting a cohort study on longevity interested in changing ADL, and in, including in the initial cohort, 50% of my cohort already have the bad ADL. I'm doomed. I'm doomed. I should not do that study. Or I need to ask for twice the money so I can only follow up those who are okay and add more people as I go along. Okay? Because my interest is to see if they will develop that and what caused that, that negative progression. Therefore, I cannot start. I need to start with most people having what? At, to be disease free and at risk of developing the condition. I want to see how that progresses over time. A uh, good thing about studying people are older, like me, Louise, and every, some of us here, is that we will develop something. We are very close to death. Okay? Yeah, we'll develop something. You don't need to wait too long. <laughs> I want to do a cohort on longevity and I include a lot of 20, 30, 40 years old. I'm going to wait for 50 years. There's nobody's going to pay for that. But the maximum of cohort, I can ask for five years for NIH. Therefore, I need to include really old people. In America, usually cohort of well, longevity started at age 70 because they are dying 81 to 90, right? For most places. 
Anyhow, that's a risk. And then this test rate is the same numerator as the risk, but the person time in the denominator. Let me show how do they relate. Oh, I forgot to mention the odds. Oh, yes. uh, we're dealing with cohort study more than anything, but I will review prevalence like I did, and I'm reviewing the odds. So the odds, it's just, <laughs> so if I have, uh, well, let's, let's, let's go along. Okay, the odds are not a measure that turns into something very used over the past 30, 40 years in epidemiology, the odds ratio. But there are many types of odds ratio that people here, most people here don't know. They only talk about odds ratio. But they have different meanings, different interpretation, and one is a true odds ratio, the other one a fake odds ratio. The other one is just, I'll explain that later on when we do a, a little bit of a case control. So the odd exposure, uh, better to show it here with the case. It's better with the example. So the odd is the probability of, it's come from gaming, from the game of horse racing, okay? Or poker, or whatever. So the probability of a win versus the probability of not having a win. That's the odds. I say, okay, I have three things could happen here. I have one in three chance of that happening. So one over three divided by two over three. That's the odds. Not the odds ratio, that's the odds. The odds is already a ratio. You with me? That's why it's confused for many people. So odds ratio is nothing more than a ratio of, of a ratio. It's the ratio of the probability of the event happening minus divided by the probability of the event not happening. Among those have some characteristics divided by the same ratio among those have some other characteristics. You follow that? It's kind of closure. We'll see. We'll see. So suppose the probability that you win is one-fourth. The odds of winning is one-fourth divided by three-fourths, right? Because you all have to add up to four over four, right? So oh, one-third. One-fourth divided by three-fourths is actually one-third, folks. You see? Pay attention to those numbers, how they play around. Sometimes refer to odds of one to three. But it actually is one over four divided by three over four. The odds are one to three in gaming. It's exactly that. My dad never studied past high school, but he was like a genius. I four brothers. You give us the mezada, the money, uh -huh. and come and say, come play with me. He was a professional player, truly professional player. He made millions of dollars playing poker in Las Vegas and Atlantic City. So you bring us to them, to the table, and then stop playing piff puff. He called piff puff. Well, he calculated all this probability as he would go along. I was like, the cards were coming through. He was calculating that. Okay? We never won. 14 years. So everybody, nobody in my favorite place. That's Sam. We, we gave up playing cards. Because he would always win. Because he was calculating the odds better than nobody else. So I took him, actually, with me to Atlantic City. I actually know. It's the second time. I was in Las Vegas. And after one hour with uh, 21, remember that blackjack? The, the, the courier uh, security guard said, hey, say, sir. He cannot be here. He doesn't understand any English. And he looked at me and I said, why? And I didn't know that. That was like 20 some years ago. I said, no, your dad is counting cards. I said, but that's his advantage. He's smart. Mm -hmm. I cannot count cards. You can't do that. He beat the lady for doing blackjack. He made like five, $6,000 in less than 30 or 40 minutes. He beat that all the time. You never bet on the wrong number because you're calculating the odds better than nobody else. Mm -hmm. And that's what the concept comes from. It's from odds. Because you calculate as the card is coming through, you know how many of your denominators, how many cards you have in a game of cards, how many of aces, how many of hearts, how many fives are aces, how many five are. So if you see four people in a blackjack, and that's a coming you guys play too. So the more people are in, the better the odds for him. Because you see more cards and you make what's left off. And you calculate the proportion and say, no, it's not a good card to go. And you now you bet. When it was good for him to go, he would bet big. So he won 80 to, to 2. The odds are 82 to beat this woman. Amazing. But that's it. That's odds ratio. So in epidemiology, odds are important part of to talk about odds of disease, okay, in a cohort study. So a cohort study can calculate the risk. Remember the proportion? The UK is divided by the denominator of people at risk. But I also can calculate the odds of the disease. So the odds of the disease, let's say I have 100 people in a cohort. And... Over one year in the cohort, 100, 100 people are calling up. 10 of them developed the condition, right? So it's 10 over 100. 
That's why not the probability of happening the disease. Divide by the probability of not happening, which is 90 over 100. That's the odds. When I divide 10 over 100, divide by 9 over 100, that's the odds. The odds of disease. Why I'm saying odds of disease? Because I'm in a cohort study. I'm following up people that are at risk for developing the disease. They don't have the disease. They will develop over time. If 10 of them develop the disease, they stay divided by 100. And those who did not develop the disease become the numerator of the next odds, 190 over 100. So it's 10 over 100 divided by 90 over 100. Across the hundreds, you have what? 10 over, nine, over, uh, over 90. So you have what? One ninth. That's the odds of disease. And if you divide that odds and the group exposed to something divided by the, odd, the, the group not exposing something, that's the odd ratio. But what kind of odd ratio? The risk odd ratio. Risk odd ratio. R O R. Because it's coming from a cohort study. I'm going to show it to you. So probability of disease, I gave an example by heart here. Odds is equal to risk, so to speak. Okay? Read it. I don't want to show it to you. Another example. Well, a similar example. You have, you're have following people up here. You have cross-sectional HIV survey. By the way, here's different. The example I gave you was a cohort of 100 people. 10 developed the disease over time. And 90 do not. So it's 10 over 90. That's your odd of disease. Here, I have a cross-section of study. Can I calculate the odds? Yeah. It's a proportion. Prevalence is also probability. But the interpretation is going to be different. Do I call that odds of disease? I could. But it's a prevalence odds of disease. It's not a risk odds of disease. Okay? So I have a survey of 300 uh, people. For, I evaluate them for HIV, and I found out it's a real paper. I put the publication in. This is coming old, man. This is 1990 when I did that. So it's one over 300. There's one case of HIV out of 300 women at sample randomly in that study here on AIDS. So your odds is one divided by 300 divided by 299 divided by 300. Odds of disease versus odds of non-disease. Probability of win versus probability of not winning. Now I have my odds, 1 over 299. That's the prevalence odds of disease. And if I divide the prevalence odds of disease, because I have all the information about these women, all of them, I say some of them are heavy drinkers. And I found out that the heavy drinkers have uh, 5 to uh, 300 versus 295 over 200, something like that. Okay, then I have something else. I have the odds, prevalence odds of disease among people who are heavy drinking. And I do the same for the other group that don't heavy drink and found a little different when I divide one by the other. The prevalence odds ratio of disease among those who are heavy drinkers versus non heavy drinkers. I have a prevalence odds ratio. I don't call exposure odds ratio, even though it's about exposure, because it's done at the same period of time. I call prevalence odds ratio. I'm going to show you actually real uh, data. Just not to forget, I should have given to you, uh, maybe I'll give it later on, but think about all proportions are coming from what? The new cases follow a, pro, uh, what, a binomial distribution, right? The P follows a binomial distribution. But the binomial, I'm going to show you mathematically later on, that's part of the reason for this curve. It's coming from binomial NP with various NPQ or NP multiplied by 1 minus P. That's your variance. If you take the square root of that, that's just standard deviation. And by law of large numbers, remember? Law of large numbers. If you have counting proportions among 30 or more people, you start approximating a normal distribution. The binomial becomes a normal after 100 for sure, after 1,000 people. Absolutely. Okay? So what you have is like the variance of all proportions, like prevalence or risk, is very simple. Remember, the variance is PQ. Okay, and the PQ of n square root of that, that's your standard deviation. So if you have P, a proportion plus or minus 1.96 standard deviation, you have your 95% confidence in the value. Okay, and that's what I'm showing to you here. Now, you can, you can calculate those confidence in the value. I'm showing you one to you, that's one for risk. First, let's show the one for prevalence. It's very similar to the one for risk, but there's four or five different ways to calculate confidence of risk. 
And I'll show you that later on why. Because the binomial turns into a Poisson distribution. But anyhow, I'm going ahead of myself. So you have prevalence N1 divided by N in that table. Remember that famous, uh, I already skipped the, the two by two table. So your PQ over N, that's your variance. If you divide, you take the square root of your standard deviation you by 196, you have your prevalence. So for that example, I gave it to you. That's the confidence interval I calculate for the 0.1 here. Okay, that's your confidence interval 1.96. Read it. I don't need to show you this. The risk is very similar, but there are other ways to calculate risk. You can calculate exactly like I did in the prevalence risk. Uh, your variance would be R, which is your risk, multiply one minus R, right? Divide by N, square root of the whole thing. I can do that. But there's another tricky one made out of delta methods in calculus, which is basically the risk is I of N. New cases divided by total N. And if I take this R, multiply by one, one of R, the N, I end up with the same thing as the PQ of N. And that's the same thing. The other way to calculate risk is um, you take the log of the risk. Why? Because the risk, as well as the odds, they have a very abnormal distribution with a long right tail because they follow a kind of exponential uh, type of distribution. So in this situation, if you take the log of it, you kind of uh, normalize, right? If you take the log, something has a long tail, you end up, people migrate it to a middle number, right? You become a little bit. So once you have that, you can then calculate a slightly different uh, of this interval. I'll show you my mathematical later on. Don't worry about it. Just wanted to read it later on. And I'm giving you examples here. Don't calculate fancy confidence interval unless it's really needed. For anything over 100, those calculations, those examples I give you, it's all you need. And you can program in Excel to do that. They don't need fancy software to do that. So again, it's the same idea with the risk is a little different. Uh, you can also add the log of the R. And then you own 96 is going to follow more or less the same distribution because they are normalized distribution. The exact confidence interval follow that form. I don't want you to go crazy about it. Study, ask me a question. Later on at the end of the day, once your question I explain piece by piece, this is too intense in this course. What time is it? We already lost 30 minutes to start. I need to give you a break. Okay. So this is a confidence interval based on what we call the Poisson distribution, remember I mentioned the instance rate is coming from a Poisson distribution, the instance density or instance rate. You cannot calculate risk like you do for confidence of how you do for risk because the risk is based on a binomial distribution. I'm going to show you later on now. And then the instance density or instance rates come from Poisson. You have the form of the Poisson, the summation of e to the minus mu. Mu is your parameter and Poisson. Poisson has only two parameters the average, which is mu and the variance, which is also mu, okay? So it's E of uh, exponentially to mu that multiplies mu itself elevated to the I. That's the number of time. It's exactly similar to interest rate in a bank, okay? So you have the lower and upper confidence interval. Figure out, read it, ask me a question. There's another trick. To do this one here, I can approximate through a normal distribution with this formula here. Read about it, ask me a question. I'll give an example. And there's this other one. You see how many ones I have for our incidence rate? I'm giving them all to you. This is all, if you have basics Excel, you can program all of that in Excel. You don't need to be a genius in mathematics to do that. I swear. Okay? There's not a variation of it. And I give you an example. I need to finish this. And there's a lot of stuff they call rate, which are not rate. But whatever. Many of here are rate, but some of them are not. So just figure Case study, um, you want to do a break now? Do a case study later on. Let's do a break because you start late. Uh, 10 minutes break, folks. 15 minutes. 15, minutes 15, break. 15. And people can use this time to place questions in the chat of the transmission. So uh, I'll prefer later because we have such a condensed question. And you'll read uh, I'll, later. later on, I'll respond to your question by the end of the day because we have a lot of material to cover okay. and we need to be. Very, very so precise. It's 10 30, uh, a quarter to 11. We're just going to start again, okay? Thank you, being a crazy audience. Incredible. Don't say a word. That's wonderful. Thank you. Como é que eu faço? Que tiro da aula aí? Não, deixa aqui que eu vou dar essa. Esse que está aí. Como é que foi? Isso aqui eu vou ter que ter na hora que eu quero começar assim.
tivesse um, uma geral assim, todos esses corsários que nós estamos eles servem, na verdade, como eles não têm o, o cause and effect, para levantar os fatores, levantar os fatores que você vai incluir num, num coorte para calcular o risco real.
Ok, vou confirmar aí. Deixa eu comer. Chocou dourado, né? Mas quem que eu gostar ele? É você, você é do grupo. Se eu gostar ele, é que eu gostei. Todo mundo do GT Junto de Magá, que pesquisa, música, não conseguiu ver quantos que estavam aqui, que estão inscritos. Esse daqui, né? Isso. Ok. Então, tá, a, Alessandra, Alessandra, dá para ver se está aparecendo a imagem também? Está ok, mas está continuando. Está tudo, a imagem do, vi, do, do slide, assim. Tá bom, então estamos de volta, pessoal. O que, que é? O que, que você quer? Posso começar? Vou abrir. Esse aqui? É, é, aqui, ó. tá ligado. Tá ouvindo aí? Não tá ouvindo nada? Tá ligado, tá tudo ok. Esse. Tá. Não, aqui, levanta a mão aqui. Aqui é a câmera. Aqui é perto aqui, vai. Tá. E aqui a gente vai compartilhar a apresentação. Windows. E aí. Desapareceu. Essa cara. daqui? Qual? Não, Não, você fechou. Eu fechei. É. Agora já está lá, o Eduardo. Qual das três? Essa daqui? Essa aí. Essa daqui, né? Tá, então deixa eu compartilhar ela aqui. Essa daqui. É. Alessandra, está tá aparecendo? Está tá aparecendo tudo, Alessandra? Está aparecendo. Está com som? Tá com tudo som? ok, tá Pedro. Som? Tudo ok, tudo ok. Ah, tá. Tá, tá bom. Tá, obrigado. Ele está captando aqui, não sei se Está captando pelo telefone. Pelo... Estão me ouvindo bem agora? Tá bom. Então, a gente falou de prevalência, de risco e de... Uh... So, we spoke about prevalence, risk and incidence rate. And I showed a list of measures, many of them called rate, but they're not true rate. Just remind the key ones that people make mistakes. Case fatality rate is not a rate, it's the inverse of the survival. It's a proportion. It's a form of risk, okay? The probability of dying within a follow-up period among those who are at risk from dying. The other misnomer is cumulative incidence rate. There's no such a thing as a risk. It's the probability of developing a condition over a period of time among those who are at risk for developing the condition during the observation period of time. Okay? And the only rate that exists in epidemiology is the incidence rate or incidence density in which the new cases of disease is exactly like the risk There are cases that develop over time among the person time. And I also showed you the instance rate can be measured in a general way, in a large population, because as if you have a gigantic cohort. But I don't follow everybody in the city of Sao Paulo. There's really 12 million people. No, I'm not following 12 million people. I don't need to. If I assume that people going in and out of the cohort, the numbers going in and out of the cohort are the same. So, again, it follows. I don't know why. We're bringing the image back. Don't worry about it. It takes only a second. Actually, 30 seconds. Okay, so I'm going to show a very quick case study on house to infection. It's a true case. It's in a specific book. I think I put in your list. If not, this afternoon, I'll send you the book. Um, it's a great book for people who want to initiate in clinical epidemiology with a vision of managing 
health system, population health. And I've been using this book for over 10 years. So a 60-year-old, uh, previously healthy female chemist appears in your hospital um, outpatient setting or in your emergency room. She has shortness of breath, pale, pulse is very high, but not too high, but it's high, 110 uh, beats per minute. The concentration of um, hemoglobin, it's 20%, which is low. The white blood cell count is 20,000, which is elevated. Peripheral blood smear shows a typical myeloma blast. That means new cells are being formed by your medulla, by your bone medulla. So that's a case of a very aggressive infection, but also something else could be going on. So hospitalized with diagnosis of acute myelogenous leukemia. It's very appropriate. If I see a patient like that, in my time when I was a primary care doctor, I would suspect leukemia. Okay? So it's diagnosed with leukemia, and then later that is confirmed by bone marrow aspirate and biopsy. Basically, I puncture the bone, takes the medulla a material, examine in the microscope, and I'm certain it is um, myelogenous uh, leukemia. So now you have decisions to be made. So what decisions are made? I'm simplifying a case. Usually I use that as an exercise with all of you, and we go little by little. So chemotherapy is started. Three weeks later, the temperature of that one goes up. The chemotherapy is meaning I'm treating the leukemia with chemotherapy. But then three weeks later, she is hospitalized, by the way, and then the temperature starts going up. The neutral fuel counts, that's a specific type of white blood cell, as you remember. It's 100 UL, abnormally low, very low neutral fuel count. So she had very little chance of getting an infection with such a low count of uh, neutral fuel. No source of infection is apparent in this uh, patient. Blood urine cultures are taken. Wide range of infectious agent antibiotics are given. Uh, culture confirms staphylococcus in the blood. Antibiotic therapy initiated wide spectrum. My question to you is, should I use antibiotic? Why wide spectrum? So how do you make decisions like that in a hospital setting if you're a hospital administrator? You have your hospital infection expert. In America, it's obligated by law. You have to have at least one physician who is an infectious disease expert who also study a lot of epidemiology and work with the public health folks of state epidemiologists. And then you make decisions about something like that. Yeah, well, I'm going to skip to a lot of stuff. This is usually how the case study develops. Ask questions that people start. And half of the class get things right. It's a combination of understanding medicine and statistics. And it's more arts than science. Science helps, but there's a lot of arts. You know, medicine is not pure science. Decision-making. What's the rationale for treating with antibiotics? Physicians concluded the risk of complication from delay antibiotic therapy outweighed the risk or harm from treating administered before the cause of fever could be determined. So instead of waiting for the term, especially for the culture, it takes five days, right? Or three days at minimum. So why? What drives the decision? It's studies done before, basically. I'm simplifying stuff. So usually in medicine, you have a lot of issues. In practice, you know, oh, people did that in the past. Political pressure, economic pressure. I need to do this. Availability, that's what we know. Yeah, but better to do bad sciences. So there are three, I'm going to describe three studies that help to make decisions about that patient, okay? And the three studies, one of them established the probability of developing infection. The other one established the probability of being a specific bacteria that's called the infection. And the other one established how rapid this infection is happening. So which one given the probability of developing infection? Which measure in epidemiology given the probability of developing infection in a hospital setting in a patient with leukemia? That's the risk, folks. Which is the one that's going to give me the probability that, that specific bacteria is the cause of infection? Do you have a guess for that? It's form of proportion. It's the prevalence. I'm going to show you how. And what's the one that gives the rapidity, the velocity at which new cases of infections are occurring? Which measures that in epidemiology? Incidence, folks. The only true rate, velocity, speed at which things are occurring, rapidity, okay? So that's the, so you're going to use those three measures. Incidentally, I've done those studies in Missouri. 
because I was the state epidemiologist for nine years in 1995 to 2002. It's the highest authority in public health in the state that makes decisions where to go and study to outbreaks or infection or whatever. So risk, how likely is the patient has a bacterial infection? Study was designed with 5,000 participants. What type of study is that? I'm gonna learn with you all together. We're gonna relearn what a cohort study is, a cohort study. So infections documented by culture, not including at the admission, occur within 40 hours, 48 hours of admission, occur no more than 48 hours after discharge. So if you acquire infection, two days before you're admitted and two days after means you have symptoms and signs of infection, Within that four times four days window, you are called a case of infection. Okay, that's your case definition of infection. So we started designing five thousand patients. They end up enrolling five thousand thirty one patients. Are followed up five ninety six patients developed infection during the study period. So the risk in that study period was twelve percent, which is five ninety six cases divided by the total number at risk for developing infection at the beginning of follow-up, 5,031. So I can even go farther and say, I want to more refine because I'm interested in leukemia. So I want to say not just all patients, out of these 5,031, are there any who are just cancer patients with leukemia? Okay? Yes, there is. And are they confirmed to have low granulocyte uh, count? So all types of leukemia, not just biology, but all leukemia give granulocyte count that is very low. So I include the subsetting of the original uh, 5,031. That new subsetting has 1,022 leukemia patients. Among them, 530 developed the bacterial infection. So out of those 596, 530 are leukemia patients that develop infection. See how that's different now? Now I have a 52% infection rate or risk. Rate is the wrong term that's used, but people call rate. When the people show me that, they say it's a rate. They say, no, it's a risk, but we're not going to fight. I accept your wording, rate. So it's 52% of them develop the condition within the period of observation. So the chance of a leukemia patient developing infection is 52% in a hospital in America. Wouldn't you describe it, prescribe antibiotic? I'll give antibiotic the first second that's a person's in there. But I need to know what type of antibiotic. Should I give a microlide, like um, erythromycin? Or should I give a ample spectrum, um, gram negative attacking type of antibiotics? Like uh, Keflex? Oh, it's old now. Maybe some other, you know, takes gram positive than bacteroid and stuff like that. So those decisions have to be made, not just, oh, I have infection. I need to know a little bit more. Right? So what type of infection? Hey, that hospital does something that most good hospitals in America do. They do constant studies every year, two, three times a year, of what's the most prevalent bacteria colonizing the skin, saliva of people there. Workers, patients waiting in observation room, some hospitals ambulatory patient care, urgent care. Here and there say, hey, do you mind be part of that study? I'm gonna just scrub your skin, is it okay? And you sign a consent, now you do it by, uh, you know, you show the community, yes, yes, <laughs> consent. Okay, and go swab the skin. So you take a sample, a random sample of patients waiting in your observation room or emergency care and ambulatory care of that hospital. And I do the same, I can spend the same with the uh, nurse population as they come in, as they go out. Not during, because during they're gonna go to sterilized place, some areas in the hospital, Contrary to what people say, the cleanest place in the world. Because you sterilize everything sometimes, right? But you do that constantly and you establish the prevalence of all bacteria circulating. And guess what? Staphylococcus virus in the same hospital, it was the most prevalent bacteria. 65% of the colonies in the skin and clothing of patients and people there were Staphylococcus virus. The other 38% are the, all the other bacteria. So this is huge because they are like hundreds of bacteria, right? So Staphylococcus virus, extremely resistant to antibiotic, is not uncommon, unfortunately. The other one is Clostridium uh, bacillus difficile. Okay? These are the two common uh, right now in hospitals. So now I know what the chance, what the antibiotic to prescribe. I need to get an antibiotic that takes me that damn Staphylococcus virus out and knock him out. 
So now I look at my studies and I say, well, what happens if I don't treat? If this thing is really resistant, the hospital directors worry. 62% staphylococcus, patients with leukemia, but all the, there are other kind of deficiencies, not only leukemia patients, people taking most treatment for um, arthritis and things like that, have their immune depressed, older people, little children have immune uh, compromised for many diseases. So I say, I want to know what the speed at which these effects occur in my hospital. And they do that constantly. So out of the 5,031 patients, we observe 128,000 basically person years of observation, person days here. Okay, so that's the number of all the people in the cohort. By the way, if you take the person years of observation of person days and divide by the new cases of, of the, I'm sorry, by the people being observed in your cohort, you get what you call average length of stay. Average that people stay in that hospital is 24 days, hospitalized people. Some people stay for a whole year, right? They're dying, right? They're in coma or something, and some people stay for a few hours. They average 25 days. That's average length of stay. So that's just curiosity. Because I also teach this course for hospital directors to understand how to use epidemiology to, to do better management of their patient population. So now we have the instance rate, 596 new cases divided by 127,859 person days of observation. So my new incidence rate now is 0 0.047 patient day, which translates into 4.7 by every thousand patient day. So every time I see a thousand patient day, let's say I have a hospital that my observation number of beds is a thousand, large hospitals, there's about a thousand, medium size of a thousand beds, right? So every day there, the chance of having an infection is 4.7. There'll be 4.7 cases of new infection and 62% of those are gonna be staphylococcus. For every thousand patients. For every thousand, no, every thousand patient day. But if you have a thousand beds, it's every day. You mean, I, mean, oh, I told you it's a mid-size, no big hospital can be bigger than that, but it's a large, Mid-sized to large hospitals, small hospitals, anything below that. Real small hospitals below 300. My hospital is about 500 there at the University of Missouri Health System. Anyhow, so now we have on average 0.47% of patients, which is wrong, but it's right. Here I'm making an approximation to the risk, and I'll show it to you mathematically how the risk <coughs> and the incidence rate are related. I can come from one and create the other, and vice versa. Okay? They're just... Families of exponential distribution statistics. Uh, by the way, boy, I would love to be his pet. <laughs> That's a silly thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, quickly, uh, help me here to go to the next one because we need to. So you now have an example of how these things are different, okay, but related and how they can be used. In hospital setting, I'm going to give you a real example now in epidemiology for or gravity, so to speak. Which one? Go to sectional uh, cohort. Is control. Go to the cross section quickly. So I'm gonna. I'm just gonna go to the beginning of it, and then we're gonna go case control and go cohort. Okay. We need to finish tomorrow. We finish tomorrow cohort because tomorrow is gonna focus on cohort and the mathematics of cohort. So we know now about the measures. Are they see me? Are they see me now? Can you see me? On this Sunday. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So now you know the three measures. I give examples in the hospital infection. True case. This is not a made up case. I I come up with a lot of made up stuff. I created out of the blue. But this one is actually true case. It's in a book. I'll send you. I don't think it's in the list of public. It may be, but not. If it's not, I'll send it to all of you this afternoon the book so you can find it. It's an excellent book for a good introductory clinic epidemiology. And for people also who are gonna work for traditional epidemiology through hospital administration, it's an exceptional book, okay? But anyhow, so I'm gonna quickly cover the three fundamental studies in epidemiology, the observational design, because you can always, you can always do a clinical trial. Yes, a randomized clinical trial or intervention. We're gonna talk about that on Wednesday. But ethically, it's so hard to do it and to do everything that I need. I start with observational design. And the lowest level of observational design, if I'm not counting correlation study or ecological studies, part of it, I'm not, because I don't have the time. If I had, I'll go for a case study in medicine. 
One case, I have an example, one case that I did that entangled a huge study later on. So we could start with a case study. For a case study, I can have a case series, which is a bunch of patients like HIV. I'll tell the story quickly because it's fundamentally important. The real app is start with one case. HIV back in the 80s started with one case, anomalous case of pneumonia kyrene, an infection of your lung by a specific bacteria that's so rare. And that man who had that was a very young and healthy man otherwise until that point. So that, that case baffled the physician there in California. So how is that possible? This thing only happened to extremely sick people, older people with all kinds of cancer dying. It's a secondary opportunistic infection in the hospital, pneumocystic carine. Okay? And that man was young and healthy until a few weeks or months earlier. That was the first case. So it's not starting that case. What's going on here? And then all of a sudden they start having a series of cases. They did a series study. So there's one case published on pneumocystic carine among young men. There was a series of cases. After the series of cases, they start maybe seeing something different. They're all having something common. All of them are homosexual men. Can it be a cause or can it be associated with the cause, the cause, the cause of the cause? They start going after. After that, they've done more general prevalence studies of people of the same type and a case control study, then cohort studies. And then they established the causation. They were considered to be so strong, the relative risk on a cohort study say, this is what caused it. And then they went to clinical trials, how to treat it with the medication. And now nobody dies of HIV. It's very rare. I, I have a patient I met. They had 40-some years with HIV. It was the first case in Georgia. Treated on CDC. Stopped. So, again, I'm not covering all of that. Case study, case series, ecological studies. I'm just going to give an overview of cross-section of case control, then go deep into the court study. So, what distinguish uh, between... Uh, I'm going to skip a lot of that. Subject are selected in a cross-sectional study because they are members of a certain population, subset of a certain time. They're just a sample. That's what they are. You can read about it. It's your lecture. I'm going to show you how is it done. But this drawing here, I can throw that in a case, a cohort study, a case control study, a nested case control study, a case-based case control study. They're all going to look alike. But you need to understand the difference is that the eligible here and the source population can be the same, can be different. Participation can be very similar across the study. But what I get, uh, the exposed group and the outcome group is very different. And cohort studies or case control, the outcome is actually the disease that happened over a period of time. There's all a period of time of observation. And across sex, there's no period of time. Exposure to whatever factor and the measurement of your outcome is done at the same time. So I don't know what precedes what. And that's why I end up with situations like those I mentioned in the prevalence surveys we do in America for 40 years, the behavior respect surveillance system. You end up with people who have the worst behavior having the best health, and people who have the best behavior having the worst health. Because over time, the educated people in America became educated about being lazy, about eating too much, about smoking too much, about drinking too much. Everything you should do. So they change their behavior, and then the prevalence is showing that. And then the disease don't change. Diabetes change easily? No. It's very tough, right? It's curable, but it's very tough to cure it. Because you need to change everything your whole life. This is your life. And you go backward and say, hey, like my twin brother said, I need to be my, like my brother.
Então, ele cortou para manter a sua... Como é que está a imagem aí? Está aparecendo? Agora, apareceu a imagem e a voz? Não, 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 não é isso, não. Não, não é isso, não. Está tá conectado de novo. Ele precisa dar autorização para a gente para compartilhamento. Tá, agora foi. Não está aparecendo. Tem um ledzinho. Ok? The sound. Então, essa apresentação que vocês estão vendo aqui... This presentation, what? Oh, this presentation that you're seeing could be... We're going to see repeated the, the little boxes everywhere, but the, the meaning is different. Here, we, the exposure and the outcomes are measured at the same time. Mm -hmm. But it's a very important study because you, it gives rise to the hypothesis to be tested later on. Two purpose of prevalence studies. Main purpose is to measure the size of the health problem usually in, in public health and medicine. That's the main purpose. Second purpose is to generate hypotheses that could be tested with better observational design. What is better? Observational design, they're na analytical in nature. This is more descriptive in nature. Okay? The other ones, case control or cohort study, are analytical in nature because they have a precedent that established when you have a case control or cohort study. Which precedent is that? That exposure always precedes the outcome of interest over time. You have guarantee of that phenomenon. If you have guarantee of that, when you do the relationship between the exposure to whatever factor and the outcome, whatever is the outcome, you have an indirect way of measuring causality. It doesn't mean it's causing, but it means that it's very likely it's causing. Whereas in a prevalence study, I don't have that. But I can use it again, just to remind you, to generate hypotheses. In the case of longevity, Luis is asking to remind everybody here, If you study a cohort of older people, you don't start with a cohort. You start with a, with a hypothesis you want to test. But what generates the idea to test a hypothesis? Cross-sectional studies. <laughs> And also, once you establish your cohort, you need to have some measures prior, prior to establish or design a cohort so you can measure your sample size, right? So to measure your sample size, how do you come up with a sample size estimation? It's a big formula. The big formula involves the variance of something you want to measure. You want to measure what? New cases happening among exposed and unexposed people. So you need to have some measure of the exposure and some measure of the outcome in the general population. You come to a cross-section and study those survey. And to be sure, at the beginning of your cohort study, I'm going to show it to you, you do a, a census or a cross-sectional study, establish your baseline measure of your cohort to be followed up. So you're going to measure everything again. But there are prior studies that you use. Sometimes you don't need to do prevalence studies to develop your cohort. There are many other studies done. You use that literature review to allow you to get Solange and say, Solange, calculate the sample size for these studies that I need to know. That's a cohort study for a relative risk. So what's the expected relative risk? How do I measure that? Well, I don't have, there was no cohort study done before, but there's a prevalence ratio here. Prevalence ratio, the ratio of those exposed and exposed. Not perfect, I told you, but it's a bad estimation of maybe the relative risk if the association are retained and controlled. So you need to start from something. So the frequency of the, the, the outcome you want to measure to calculate the sample. Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. So you need to know measures before, and most of those measures come from cross sectional studies or prevalence studies. Mm -hmm. To establish a cohort, you need a lot of measure, okay? And the fundamental measure to calculate the sample size is the magnitude of the relative risk for cohort study. And if you really want to do a study 
on survivorship of cancer patients or any treatment drug, you also need to know what's the survival ratio expectation for those who are exposed and unexposed, right? which is the inverse of the case fatality, which is a form of risk among those who have the disease already, but you're looking to a different outcome. You look at death, dying or surviving. Okay? So that's what the cross-section is all about. And I have this drawing here to show you that's really a survey. The eligible population is your survey population. Okay? Establish, this is an example of textile manufacturer workers. I established how many are eligible, ineligible. Okay, and then I have the, I'm not going to get into that on here. And of course, start out getting details, how he's done. Um, and then you sample these people, and then you end up with people who have job A, people have job B, and then they have respiratory disease, not respiratory disease. So you do an occupational study, but it's a cross-sectional study, and you can establish some general relationships there. Okay, you can come up with hypotheses to test but you know these are not causal hypotheses to be tested. These are just general associations. There's a difference between a general association and a causal association measure. So prevalence ratios or prevalence odds or prevalence odds ratios are just measures of association. Risk odds ratio, risk ratio, exposure odds ratio, I'm going to show it to you in a case control study. And... Um, Exposure odds are measure of association. They are causal, inherently causal. The analytical studies versus non-analytical. So the cross-section is not, I'm approaching here, so I happen to be an analytical, but it's not supposed to be. And many people do that, including mine. Okay, so you end up with something like that. Prevalence of disease in a group, C, A, B, C, D. You have prevalence of disease that won't get exposed, A over place, A plus B. A over A plus B is a prevalence of disease, you see? Column, first column is disease, divide by all of those who are exposed, yes. And then you have prevalence of disease among those who are not exposed, whatever you're looking at exposure. you got a prevalence ratio. You can also calculate the prevalence odds, I'll show an example before here, the prevalence odds. See that? Prevalence of disease in exposed group divided by prevalence of disease in unexposed group. That's your prevalence odds ratio. I have two prevalence odds, one divided by the other. And the prevalence odd is one proportion divided by the other. It's one proportion divided by one minus the other proportion. That's a prevalence odds. So one proportion P divided by one minus P is a prevalence odds if it's among the diseased people, right? If I divide that, because I say these are the exposed prevalence odds, by the unexposed prevalence odds, I have two prevalence odds, one divided by the other. That's a prevalence odds ratio. A ratio of two prevalence odds. Okay, that's a prevalence odds ratio. So I can have lots of measure here from the prevalence study. A prevalence ratio, which is a prevalence one group divided by prevalence the other group, and the prevalence odds ratio, which is a prevalence odds one group divided by the prevalence odds of another group. Okay, both are measured of associations, and I don't call them causal, and I'm not going to go stupidly say in a paper, hey, these people are more likely than these people to develop that. No. More likely to develop implies a time period of observation, implies a follow-up, and implies new cases occurring. The right sentence is that the prevalence of this group is twice greater than that group. The prevalence of this group is 1.9 greater than this group. The prevalence of this group is 0.5 of the other group. Not more likely. Okay, so that's what Prevalence odds ratio can give you an example here. Coronary heart disease and physical activity. In this study here, there are 89 people. I take a sample, 89 people, 14 develop or have, have already uh, coronary heart disease. 75 do not have coronary heart disease. I have a lot of measures to make, but I'm looking at prevalence rate. So prevalence rate of those well, in the S group is three divided by 90, right? They are very active and they have Three out of them develop coronary heart disease. The other group is inactive, and 14 of 89 develop uh, heart disease. Okay, so what you have now is the prevalence ratio, the two rate, the two prevalence, one divided by the other. You got something like 4.7. It looks like this one, this crazy example I created, is mimicking what should have been a risk ratio. It's clearly not coming from the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. Because in there, after 40 years, people already know they're trying to change their behavior. Once they're diagnosed with heart disease, 
they're already changing their behavior immediately. They are very active physically. So here is before that. Once I have that, it will be the inverse. It will be 1 over 4.7. It will be 0 0.38. <laughs> okay, another example here. Um, that's the true stuff from that data I, I gave it to you. And you can play around with that. So cross-sectional, you end up with things like that. But again, they are not analytical work. I'm not going to cover too much of it. As quickly so you understand, you can read this. You got a little bit more detail out of the picture. Let's go to the other one. Uh, Fred, how do I do that? Which one? Case control. Okay. Okay, so let's see here. Wait a moment. Open. Here, let's share a screen window. This is this control and where are you oh, the first one okay here it's not here okay is it i'll say that can you check is everything okay okay so so we're going to review case control and likely we're going to stop today at case control Tomorrow is going to be all about cohort and the statistical foundation for all these three studies. So you understand why, why prevalence goes this way, why incidence goes that way, why risk goes that way, why prevalence is related to incidence. So why I can use this type of regression on this analysis? Why I use this other type of regression? Why do we stratify analysis using something called Mantel Hansel and so on and so forth? So you understand how your software statistics provides you that, and you want to choose the right thing based on this lecture. I guarantee you. Okay? If I don't, you take your money back. Oh, you didn't pay for it, so bad luck. Okay. So analytic epidemiology. Now we in the realm of analytic epidemiology observation and study. Okay. So you have the difference between descriptive and analytic. I'm not going to cover that. You read it. But how do you end up with a case control? And remember, if I could start from a case case description in a medical journal, then I go to a case series. That's the evolution of epidemiology. Because it gives me sign, inside, insight on um, why this thing is happening. The HIV was typical. Case study on a person was very healthy on a disease. It never happened, ever, in a younger person. You know, my sister Karini before. And the good doctor who did those days, she knew this was unique. because said, you need to publish this thing. People need to read it and see if they can come up with some suggestion. And nobody came. Months later, nobody knew. Then uh, nearly a year later came a case series. Now we have nine or 13 something like that, small number of cases, and they all have something common. They're all male. Not a single case of women. And they're all in their mid-30s. Every one of them, there are two or three, they are like very young, 25, 26. But the absolute majority of the mid-30s, very healthy, very athletic. And more than 80% of them happen to be working, uh, or 70% in the airline industry. They're like, uh, many of them are like uh, air flight on board, you know, stewards. So you start showing the commonality and you start looking at the commonality, what does it mean? And that's what leads you to people think about that, how, being homosexual and having the disease. Otherwise, they could never have guessed that was HIV. It would take them years to figure out HIV. Once they start, they say, what does homosexual man has different than the other man to have this? Their sex is different. Could it be caused by a sexual condition? So they're getting pneumocystic carini through infection, through sex, no, it's in the lung, should be in the air. So they start finding another culprit. You see how that works? So the case studies, the case series, and then they did a cross-sectional study, and then more numbers start showing. Oh, these are people really heavy duty homosexual. They are very young, very full of money, full of free time, and they all frequent those type of clubs. So they start investigating the clubs. And it nearly disappeared, that behavior. There was a crazy behavior in the late 70s, mid to late 70s. The what? Yeah, yeah, too. I'm not going to give details yet. It's not the point. Luis, not to give details. No, no. I'm just saying that there are really clubs totally devoted to sexual crazy practices. And therefore, they are doing abnormal, not just being homosexual, not having intercourse with another man, but having crazy intercourse with another man. 
So that led them to stop believing in something. Well, we know that. We know from traditional sexual transmitted disease, the more injury during the act, the more chance of transmitting infection. That's true for uh, syphilis. It's true for gonorrhea. It's true for chlamydia. We proved that 50, 70 years earlier, 100 years earlier, by an English man on gonorrhea. So they say, now we know up to something. So this thing is coming through. We don't know what that thing is. Let's look at blood of this guy's urine of this guy's feces, air, everything they do and see if we can find something. They found the HIV virus. They never seen that virus before. It's a new virus. You see how that works? So, but the case control and the prevalence studies were used also to unearth this information. So subject identified as so case control different than cohort. I'm going to show it to you clearly. Start from the disease. So case are identified because they have the condition. So in the case of HIV, the people already have the condition. If I want to do a case control um, on uh, the case of longevity, I just mentioned to you earlier, the cohort, I'm going to stop this later on. I got a, a thousand older people, age of 65, and married will be 70, 75, all the way to 100. And I follow them up over five years. And some of them will develop a bad ADL activity of daily living over time. There are zero ADL, all of them. That's my inclusion criteria. I don't want any who do not have zero ADL. They have no problem uh, bathing themselves, uh, taking care of themselves, eating, socializing, going out, going for brisk walking, having fun, even having sex. I'd say he has to be there. Otherwise, they are not in my cohort. And then after five years, how many of those have deteriorating and develop uh, ADL at least six or seven? So I make a decision what the cutoff point is. We say 10, but maybe we'd wait for 10 years and you we'll not have enough people. So you may not reasonably say it to five. So I start with the cases. Here's different. I'm not doing a cohort. He already had the people have ADL of 10 or more. And I'm retrospective looking back and trying to find what the exposure that I'm interested in. If the exposure is being active physically in my community, okay, not just being active inside the house, but being active, whatever. All kinds of activity, leisure time as well as occupation, domestic and transport activity. The four levels of physical activity, right? Remember that for those studying chronic disease? Transportation, meaning I'm walking to get my bus, go to my bus, walk. It doesn't take house to house and bed to bed. It takes you to a block or two blocks or five blocks to, to go to a place. If you're in Columbia, Missouri, where I live, good luck. You're going to be like a mile away from your home. Because 99.9% .9 of people were, waste no time going on a bus because the bus only leaves you every mile. <laughs> you have to walk on clumped and I have to go to your house unless you live right at the bus stop. So again, you're starting with uh, the cases of ADL that's bad. And then you look back. So disease, not disease, or ADL, not ADL, exposure back. Can you see the image? Can you see this little image yet, Alexander? Okay. So why start the cases, identify suitable controls. Now I have my cases. What is my suitable control? How do you think I should follow indirectly? I'm all, by the way, it's a case control. I start with the disease, but I have an implicit period of observation. Okay? Because it's analytical. There's a period of time I always have to have in mind. That's called my universe or my population. I'm going to segment my subpopulation. So I need to think about how do I select my controls? So select cases may be incidental prevalence. Ideal case control studies, incident cases. And I'll show that later on. Probably tomorrow I'm going to show the math. Works better with the incident case. In the prevalence case, you have that issue. That the, the exposure to the risk factor may have come at the same time as the incidents. I don't know what, what, what precedes. So it's better to have incident cases. Using historical data, determinate the uh, determinant like exposure to risk factors measured retrospectively, either through a survey. If I do uh, HD, uh, ADL, I have 100 people there, uh, 50 with bad ADL, and 50 who have between 0 and 10 ADL, but not 10. Okay? And then I do a whole questionnaire and try to go back and say, in the past year, have you done A, B, and C. At least for a year, I have a recall. If and only if that recall is valid. And to do a valid recall, I need to have done another study. It's called correlation or uh, um, verification study, whatever they call it, to find out if that question is actually measured or supposed to measure. 
the validity study. But let's say my measure of recall of physical activity within a year of recall is valid. Most people could recall on average. They don't know exactly, but on average, the frequency that they exercise. I do. How many times you exercise over the past 40 years? Seven days a week. Every day of my 40 years. Unless I'm sick or I'm, I'm arrested. I was it you arrested? No, I wasn't. But, you know, I, I would not be exercising. My baby's doing in jail. So you remember, but you need to be valid. So you get the measure over time. But there's another way to get the measure. Let's say you go through records. You have done your case control using people have records somewhere. And then you can collect a sample of that record or a census of all of them who are in your study. It's not a cohort people. I start with the outcome. Okay, but I can measure that. Exposure and level of exposure results compare I compare retrospectively. Remember? So I end up with something like that, the source population, okay, the eligible, the participants, and I have the bad outcome, ADL of 10, and good outcome, any ADL, that's not exactly good, but any ADL between zero and nine, including nine, okay? And therefore, I now know which are bad, which are good, and now among them, I look back retrospect to the exposure, exposure to physical activity within a year. And then people say, well, but within a year, a person 75 years, what difference does it make one year of exercise? It may not. I have to assume that the person who did this for one year likely had done for five or 10 years before. That's an assumption. So I don't have perfect data. And I need to address that in my paper, in my limitations. So people, when they read, they understand that. Otherwise, I'm doing crazy, sh shoddy epidemiology. But at least I have something to go back. But if I do have them all in a, let's say I do a nested case control of occupational settings. People are still working after age 60. And they're all occupational people. There are people like me at 66, going 67, still working every day. So I take a case control, a case of people, my type, who have developed bad ADL between 60 uh, and 75. My cohort is not too old. Six to 75. And all of these people are working. And in America, if you work, and I am doing this for a big corporation, IBM. And they are like, you know, about a 40 years old company. And they're all in the same section. They have over, uh, if I'm not mistaken, IBM have about 40,000 employees. So I do a cohort of IBM employees. I have records because IBM have their own health system to take care of the employees. So I have their records. Year after year, month after month, every time they came to the doc. So I, now I have retrospective exposure of 30, 40 years of these people for physical activity. How many are doing leisure time when? And you can see the leisure time for people like me usually are much less than what they were at 20. I'm an exceptional case. I'm not trying to be a hero. Tell the truth. I exercise every day. But people my age don't, even those who are exercise. So you could see then that one year exposure was not sufficient in a case control study. Because they started at about seven times a week exercise or five times a week. And by 65, they're doing once every 10 days. You know what I mean? So that one year measure is going to be a biased measure of physical activity. However, I still have contrast. Compared to those who don't exercise at all, it's still some contrast. But I'm underestimating the odds ratio. The exposed group has only a one day or two of exercise. It should be more on average. Over 10, 15 years that caused that condition I'm interested in called ADL, that would be much bigger than that for the exercise. It would be like four or five uh, on average or three. Here I'm dealing with one value of one. So it's underestimating whatever measure of association we have. I will discuss that later on. So now you know that the case control study has a lot of issues here. And you need to pay attention. Think about the case control always as a cohort. Always think, okay, not everybody's working at IBM. But every human being belongs to a cohort, right? So my case control, if you're all coming from a cohort of people who are, you know, at the middle of the other cohort of people who are between age of 60 and 75 in this crazy case control I'm doing. So they all a cohort of 60, 65. They're all Americans. I'm talking about America. I know better than, than Brazil. And they're all like, I, I, knowledgeability criteria, include people the same type, like they have jobs. They're all working. So I know I have a cohort of working people 
who are age 60, so they have two commonality between them. And I may find traces of their exposure to a lot of things based on data that's already recorded, collected. I can do a case-based study and I can get incidence estimation directly to the odds. Okay, we're going to see that maybe. If I have time by the end of this thing, I'll give a whole thing about case control, but that's not the purpose. Louisa is to focus on observational cohort study and interventional trials. It's important to say that in case control, the, the, the micro thing is to have uh, controls that are very similar to cases, but you're sure about the cases. And We're going to get into that, Luis. That's the next stop in the lecture. So Luis is making the point, very important, that cases should be very similar, better. Control should be very similar case otherwise. And that's the goal. But the only way to get this done is if they come from the same cohort. So that's what I mean. Understand your underlying population, bringing them up in your study. So exclusion criteria, inclusion criteria make a big difference on that. And that's why I define specific disease of interest, have a measure that is undeniably valid of whatever outcome you have. If you say, oh, this person's diabetic, give an A1C measure. Are you familiar with hemoglobin glycate? Ah, okay, it's called A1C in English. I don't know why you call it Portuguese. Why you call it? Hemoglobin glycate. Okay, so that's one way of saying this is certainly a disease. Define the source population. I told you, the OIBM people, or I can get at least closer. They're all people of same age group and they're all coming from this city or this state, and they all have, they're working. I'm doing a case control working people because I'm interested in ADL and physical activity. And people are working are very different than non-working people in terms of physical activity. They have transport, they have leisure time, and by working, they mean mentally they're new active, maybe there's something there. Defines eligibility in the study and exclusion criteria. Uh, we don't have much time for that, uh, but I'll give an example. Uh, so anyways, this example is not what you look for. It's not Asian example. But this is, uh, I want you to read about it. The goal here is not to cover case control, but you use the exclusion, exclusion criteria to avoid lack of validity in what you're trying to estimate. Try to get as close as you can to the exposure measure that's valid. Try to get as close as you can to have incident cases. There are everything similar uh, to the control and vice versa. Controls where actually seem similar the incident case, except that one is case and another one is not case. Okay? Uh, so that's the, what I'm saying. Mirror case definition for controls, they do not have the disease, but everything is the same. They came from the same source population. And the eligibility in, in, uh, inclusion criteria should take care of the remainder of the problem. For example, if the case of women with cervical cancer over 50 years old and more, the control must be sacked for women of the same age group without the disease. Okay. Examples of comparison. I gave an example of cliff palate, a very complex. There's a lot of issue validity. Lab, Read it. Labileporino. That's the word in Portuguese, cliff palate uh, defect. Read that and ask me a question later. Criteria for selecting cases should be identical. We've gone that. Criteria for selecting cases, we read that carefully. Sources, like I said, there are many more sources sometimes we don't think about. A survey at the beginning uh, of your study can establish a lot of things that can be recollected me memory. For instance, can you recollect your uh, ingestion of five fruits and vegetables a day? Actually, you do. It's pretty decent. However, you cannot recollect for years uh, whether you've been diagnosed with hypertension. A colleague of mine from state epidemiology back then, 30 years ago, in New York State, New York, established that. His name is um, bowling. So bowling uh, established that um, if you ask the question, have you ever been diagnosed by a doctor, health practitioner, or nurse that you have hypertension or high blood pressure that's higher than average? Yes or no? That question is not valid, actually. It's the only way to get that question. But it's like 50% of them made a mistake. Because you've been told by a doctor many times your blood pressure is high, but it doesn't mean you have high blood pressure. Because he goes, just by seeing a doctor, you know, some people, the lower pressure goes huge. So again, uh, look at the source of the information. It's critical. Where's it coming from? And um, source of identification, sometimes questionnaires, the only way out. Good luck. If you're doing a case control and an outbreak investigation of a 
um, a party going wrong and everybody get infected. That's very accurate because you remember a few hours earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Even there, there's a lot of mistakes made. But if you're asking for something that's a lifetime exposure, you need to be certain that that measure on the survey is enough. Okay? And that's not only for case control, it's also true for cohort study. If all you use is a cross-sectional baseline measure. Okay? But there are sources. I give some examples here of information. So controls must be sent in a way that's independent of exposure. We didn't mention that. They should be similar to the case in every aspect. But they also should be sampled independent of exposure. If for some reason the exposure of your interest is associated in the manner in which you select the controls, you do. It's going to create bias. Okay, it's going to create selection bias. Can be selected randomly or matched to the case. That's the ideal situation. If you can sample controls, let's say you do incident cases of all men aged 16, 75 in this community, okay, who are working. And my controls are going to be a random sample of all workers that I have data on. I have a way to get to them who are the same age group, work in similar industry and still working. And I take a random sample of that. That's a perfect control. I control for every bias. Okay, but if I go through a record and say I'll sample from the record, that's a general idea, but is the record somewhat related to the fact that you're interested in some exposure? I'm interested in some specific occupation exposure, but I'm paying more attention to directors if I'm an uh, industry director or human resource person. I collected more the cases that likely will sue my company over time. So I have more records of people who have exposure to the risk factor. I'm going to create huge uh, odds ratios, but it's inflated by the fact that the company took more care of making sure I don't miss anything on those guys because they're hell lost. I need to know them about that. You see how that works? So make sure your selection of, expo of controls do not relate at all with the manner in which exposure can be measured and can happen and people can be exposed to something. Uh, somebody asked a question that I has to do with what you're talking. Uh, during a case control study, always follow this line. Uh, you stress the, the need to have a cohort, for instance, you get the cases and then you have the controls in the same cohort. But if you study uh, case control in which the cases you collect in a hospital, because it's there where the cases are, uh, you should try to get, for instance, uh, controls that perhaps in the same neighborhood where the control or the cases live or in a different uh, infirmary of the same hospital, just to, to give other ways of uh, building up a case control. Absolutely. I, I, whoever asked the question, understand how to do case control. Don't worry, you know it. Don't worry about it. You already figured it out, okay? Just remember, a case control with hospital cases, it's sometimes the only way to study something that goes in a hospital. But it's not the deal way because first off, if I'm interested in finding what causes a disease to start with, the people already in a hospitalized case or hospital cases or hospital controls, they are different than the general population. Mm -hmm. Some cases are only found in the hospital. Very rare this day and age. More and more now we find lots of cases everywhere because diagnosis is becoming very simple. Or sure, there's a difference between doing a case control inside a court. That's called case-based control or nested case control. That's a very interesting case. I'll give you an example of a nested case control. I right now have a study here in Sao Paulo. It's a cohort study. We are following up thousands of people all over Brazil who have been exposed to some chemical exposure in their blood. I don't know if they're all 100% exposed to the nutrition or to the air or to the water they drink, but they have heavy metals in their blood. Okay, so I have a cohort of people who are very uh, exposed, meaning they have a cutoff on the heavy metals measurement. If they are higher, I call them case uh, exposed. If they are lower, I call them unexposed. And I'm following them up over a 10 years time. Okay, so that's a cohort study. I can then sample from that cohort, sample the actual cases already there and do a nested case control study. It's nested inside a cohort. That's different than doing a, a case-based study um, 
actually I wouldn't call case based, okay, the true tradition cohort study using first cohort study by the way, the hospital cohorts uh, case control study, sorry. First ever uh, case control study was a hospital based case control study. All the cases are from the hospital. All the controls are on the hospital, okay? So it's very different than that one. There's a lot of issues about bias. It's that this one, case-based, don't have bias, selection bias. Because they're all in the same cohort. The problem is when I sample control that do are not coming from the same cohort with regard to the exposure of interest. Okay? So in a hospital base, all cases are really cases. No doubt about that. But I'm sampling control. How am I going to sample control? Oh, there are no cases. But there are cases of a lot of other diseases that are similar to that one disease. What if the risk factor of the other diseases are similar? Can you differentiate to tell me with certainty that ischemic heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, digestive cancer, and a whole host of other diseases do not have the same risk factor? Actually, I proved they do. So it's going to be difficult to find controls that actually express the true cohort that generate the cases that end up in the hospital with whatever disease among those that I mentioned, I mentioned about five or six, about 20, they have similar risk factors. So a case control based on a hospital is going to be difficult to select a control group to express the true original cohort that gave rise to the cases. Whereas in a nested case control, you're already in a cohort. Everybody, I know what their level of exposure to heavy metal is here in Sao Paulo, in Salvador, and three other major capitals in Brazil. Okay, and that's coming from a study done by our colleagues here at USP. Exceptionally well done study, a cohort study. I'm taking advantage of their sample, we have an NIH grant, and we select them. Yeah, but just to mention that Tamita made that question, it's uh, other ways of doing a case control apart from establishing from a cohort, just to, just to mention. Yeah, absolutely. I give an example, the hospital-based case yeah, control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also cases coming from clinics. Or you just do a sample on a population, find your cases, and then in a random sample, you can find your perfect controls. Okay? Now it's not a prevalent study because I'm looking at the disease, and then I'm going backwards now for the exposure. The problem with this is that if I don't have records on the exposure, I have to use an exposure that the recall at the same time reflects what the long-term exposure to the risk factor is. So you see how difficult it is to establish a case control out of a prevalence study? But there are many ways. There are variation of the team. But every one of them, the fundamental thing is that they need to come from the same cohort because I'm trying to do a quick and dirty cohort study. So what better than those? The, the best case control study ever is a case-based or, call, or so-called nested case control because I already established the cohorts. I know they come from the same cohort. There's no selection bias. There is going to be misclassification bias, which is the information bias. That is going to be confounding. There's going to be, you know, other things, but not selection bias. That's all I'm trying to establish of a case control. So, again, the best of the analytic observation study is the cohort. And that's why the best case control is the one that mimics a cohort because it's coming from a cohort that I guarantee is a cohort. Uh, criteria for selecting control, again, should not exceed four controls per case. Why? I'm not going to show the math, but you have no efficiency. So ideally, it should be one case for two, one case for three uh, controls. One to three, one to two is a good ratio. One to four is the maximum. Beyond that, you have no gain efficiency. I'm not going to have time to show in a whole course of six months. I do show that. When you do the calculation, stratify analysis, monthly events, I'm going to show you how those numbers play in the efficiency. For the variance becomes small. After that, you're just wasting money to have more people in the study. General population, so source of identifying control, birth certificates, medical care files, random disease dialing of the community at large. That's a survey, right? Or birth certificates or a Medicare file in America. Uh, controls, you can go to prepaid health plan to find your controls from the community that generates the cases. Yeah. Okay? Exactly. I gave you the theory, and I'm showing an example. Using hospitalized controls may bias risk estimate. I already mentioned that. Read it. But health plan gives a little bit more than just a hospital. Because health plan includes all the patients could have gone to other hospitals, right? It comes to place for the whole community. Or um, patient list that you have from public health department. 
Also, one way many studies do is to select people who are neighbors as controls or siblings or, you know, if I have a case, I have a brother, okay, and a sister. But it may be confusing because you may have situations like me and my twin brother. Twin is already a problem genetically, right? And then he married my wife's sister. So it gets more problem if you're dealing with behaviors that relate to how you live your life. It's too similar. Is it bad or good? No, it's good in ways and bad in other ways. So you need to think through it. I, I, it's not focused on case control. The focus is cohort. So I'm going quick on this. Read it. Ask me a question like the question about uh, the case and control. So you end up with similar tables like that, like this one. But remember, cross-section is different. This is case control. It's closer to a cohort study, but depending on how you select your controls, depending on how you select your cases, and how you measure exposure, you may have a lot more biases than our cohort study. So your goal is to go to a cohort. But maybe you need to go to that step. It's cheaper. It's quicker. And sometimes to explore things that um, have many possibilities of exposure, this is a good way. Once you establish your exposure in a cohort, you already have that cohort. Exposed to smoking, not exposed to smoking. You cannot change that. But here I can explore other exposures, right? I can have a lot of questions from the start. And so you can explore a lot more. And sometimes you need to do a case control to generate evidence, analytical evidence. There's an association that's caused. But there's so many possible bias that say, well, it's likely, but we don't know how much likely. The odds ratio, in this case, is going to be exposure odds ratio. I'm going to show it to you uh, tomorrow. I'm going to show how the prevalence odds ratio, the exposure odds ratio, the risk odds ratio, all relate to the risk ratio in some different ways. Okay, so what time is it, Luis? Are we about one o'clock? Okay, let me see if I go quickly here. If I need to go back, let's go some numbers here. Okay, so now you have your traditional two by two tables again. You have your cases going horizontally here. Remember, you start with the cases. You start with A plus B or M1 <coughs> cases. And we start with C plus D or M2 control. And then you retrospectively look for the exposure where you smoke or not smoke. That's exposed column, unexposed column. And then you end up with these numbers here. Proportion of exposure among cases. That's A exposed people divided by A plus B people, right? Or A divided by M1. Proportion of unexposed Cases. What's the proportion of unexposed cases? B divided by A plus B or B divided by M1. Imagine A plus B is M1 and C plus D is M2. I'm using this terminology because in risk ratio and tables for, uh, so count data for cohort, I'm going to show you the name, the, the, the name M1, M2. So it relates. So it's the idea is to get to that. Okay. Then you have the odds of exposure. Remember what the odds is. Probability of win, probability of not win. P and one minus P. So if I divide one by the other, the probability of winning, probability of not winning, that's the odds of winning. You know what I mean? Here's probability of what? I already have cases. I start with cases. So I cannot say it's the probability of disease. I already have cases. These are my follow-up people indirectly. I'm not following that retrospectively for the exposure. So it's the probability of exposure. So then I say, okay, what's the odds of exposure? A over A plus B. So I have A plus B exposed people. And among the cases, A cases, okay, are the exposed. You follow that? And then you have A over C. So you have A plus divided by A plus B, A divided by A plus C. So you have all these things that you can play with. But remember what the odds of exposure and the odds of exposure for case and control is, Okay. So you divide the two odds, you have exposure odds risk because it's odds of exposure and one group divided by the odds of exposure in the other group. If you divide one by the other by simple arithmetics, I remember that. It's arithmetic by even algebra. Okay? When you divide, you get the inverse of the other side. Okay? So you end up with AD that multiply BCs. A multiplied by D divided by B multiplied by D. Well, how can you use exposure to Okay, she's asked the question, how can you use exposure odds ratio? That's the only measure of association you have I know, I in a case control study. Uh -huh. Okay, it's the only measure you have in a case control study. You don't have a measure of prevalence of disease. 
among cases. You don't have a measure of risk of disease among cases uh, exposed. You have the odds of exposure among cases and the odds of exposure among known cases. We divide one odds by the other, you have the, prev the exposure odds ratio. I already showed the prevalence odds ratio before to you in the cross section. This is exposure <coughs> odds ratio. And I'm going to show it to you the exposure odds ratio as a measure of the risk odds ratio. It tries to measure what the risk odds ratio is in a cohort. And the risk odds ratio is an indirect measure of the relative risk or risk ratio. Show all of that later on. Don't worry about it. I'll show the math with real numbers. Disease risk or rates cannot be computed for the exposed and unexposed population. That's the truth about cost control studies. So it's not a cohort. Disease risk among exposed, I can't calculate because I don't have the true A plus C. Okay? Disease of risk among unexposed, I don't have the true A plus C plus D. Because we don't know the true exposed and exposed people, I cannot calculate that. Rather, we only have A plus C cases and B plus D controls. We can certainly calculate the proportion of exposure for cases of control. And from that, I can get the odds of exposure and the odds ratio of exposure among cases and non-cases. Okay? So the exposure odds ratio then becomes this thing. However, like I said, they are related, and I'll show that mathematically later on. The relative risk, that's what we're after, is the risk of, expo uh, of disease among exposed people divided by the risk of disease among the unexposed people. I can estimate indirectly to the exposure odds ratio. Okay? And that's what this thing is saying without proving. I'm going to prove it to you later on. Strength of a case control study. It's well suited for rare disease. It's the only way sometimes to start a rare disease. When the first cases of uh, HIV start showing, the best study done was a case control. They have case series, and then it's a large number, but it's too small number at the beginning. So a case control could be done, and they've done it. And then later on, the numbers become big. I have no better idea where the disease is coming from. I can stop with some cohort, and they did too. Okay? Well suited for studying disease with long latent periods. Well, Studying it, changing in ADL all over time. Uh, if people are still in a very healthy stage of their older life, they're in the 60s, but they still have zero ADL, that's a good time to study because if I do too young, I'm going to take forever until they develop a bad ADL. At least I have something that's feasible to do. Uh, uh, and so that ADL is actually rare. ADL of 10 is rare, actually. Why? Because most people, to get to ADL of 10, they already died. Right? No, many people are already dead. Well, they may develop ADL of 10, all of us, right before we die, but not to be part of a study. Okay? So, bottom line, it's a rare event, and to better study that among the older people, that's more likely to happen. If you want to study mortality, death among older people, you better start very old people. Because many older people, what is older people? Until about 20 years ago, 50 years old. Okay? Now we're all in the 70s here, except you. And you there, and some of the young folks on the back. You know, 60 is not that old anymore. So we need to, bottom line is the strength of this is good to study rare disease. That's the only strength. And that's the only way to do it. And also it's very cheap. I'm simplifying stuff compared to a cohort study. Remember, a cohort, I have to stop with that to measure every year. I have to follow them up. I have to examine them every now and then so I can get the measure repeated over time. Right? So it's kind of expensive. And a case control, I do it all at once. And one year, I do a whole case control because everything is based on recollection of things in the past. I establish your case, I stop your own case, and I go recollect. So, you know, usually it's a, for NIH, it's like I'm, I can do a case control with 300,000. I need a five million to do a cohort. That's the relationship. It's like one to five, one to eight, one to 10. That expensive. Limitation is inefficient for study this, uh, diseases with rare exposures. Whereas the report, I established exposure before I started, right? I started part for exposure. Like the metal, heavy metal is hard and very expensive to have to measure heavy metals. But they already have a cohort established here. They already have drawn all the blood and everybody many times over. And they have the way to measure the metals. And they did. So I already had the exposure collected and measured with certainty and with veracity, with validity. So I have my exposed group and my exposed group. That's a cohort. But in a case control, if the disposal is rare, if I want to do a case control, 
uh, coronary heart disease and heavy metal exposure. And I take a random sample of the population. It better be 100 million people. So I think I have exposure of heavy metal exposure. You see how I'm talking about? This is very rare exposure. The prevalence of being contaminated with heavy metal is very small. Unless you live in China, in Beijing. Okay, the pollution, the amount of land in the air, it's unbelievable, the particulates in the air. Some days you're in a hotel room and you can see the whole five kilometers away. The other day you open, pollution, not whether it's the same sun is there, but the pollution is so heavy, you can only see 50 meters from the hotel room window of pollution in the air. So don't you think that's heavy metal there? You ingest it. So maybe there, if I take a random sample, maybe 2,000 people, I'm going to find, you know, uh, about 100 of them will be contaminated with heavy metal. So again, not too good to study rare exposure. So there's a lot of things you need to read about that. Other limitations, you cannot compute instance rate, you already know that. And they have all possible biases that can be here, especially a selection bias. That's a big one here. Okay. So we finished that. No, no, we need to go quickly on. I would like to put that. Yeah, I would, I would like to put another one. Uh, this one? No, no, no. Can you, can you go to the base? I don't think I opened that. Can you go um, one step higher here? Yep. Go to cohort. Case uh, control. This one? No, 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 no. no. Oh. Go back, go back. Uh, Wait. Maybe it's this one. Yeah, I think I, I embedded in that. I changed because we asked me yesterday. Go. I read a question from Carolina Crowder. Is there any way of knowing whether the association found in the case control is enough to infer causality, or is it always necessary to carry out a cohort study? Okay, the question was. It's sufficient to have a case control study measure of association, a exposure alteration as a measure of association between a causal expo uh, uh, exposure and causing the disease. Is that causal? Can it establish causality with a case control study? That was the question. Yeah, depending on the degree of association. The degree of association. Well, you apply the principles of measure uh, uh, of causation, which is you know, the magnitude of the prevalence alteration. So it's very large alteration. And your study is likely to have very few biases. You stop believing a little bit more. So that's one measure. The other one is temporal relationship over time or the temporality in the dose response. If you could measure exposure in, diff in different ways than just measuring yes or no. For instance, so in Hill, they measure exposure in gradients of tobacco smoking. If you ever smoke. If you smoke at least 100 in a lifetime, if you smoke on average of two cigarettes a day, one pack, two packs, three packs, five packs, if you smoke that for X number of months or years, it could establish that. But it's a cohort and a case control. They did both. Okay. So once you that, have that, then you can still establish an alteration that's not just one measure. You have a gradient of alteration. It goes from one, which is no association, to 1.5. Two, they did that in a cohort study. Uh, but also they did with the case control done after the fact. The framing study came like that. So then you have two issues of causality. You have measure strength of the association, that's the magnitude of the alteration, and you have temp temporality or those response in the measure. You have nearly absence of bias, like in the framing for some issues. Okay? They establish that. You have total control of confounding. So we start believing, and then you have replication, multiple studies, for instance, for lung cancer uh, and, uh, and tobacco use, especially cigarette smoking, absolute majority of studies by 1964 were case control, not cohort. But then it was sufficient for the National Service of Public Health in America called DHSS, Department of Health and Human Services, to send an official note in 1964 saying tobacco may cause harm to your health, especially heart disease and lung cancer. May cause, but that's sufficient from public health standpoint. Think about going against the whole industry of tobacco. 
after the automobile industry back then and armament and Hollywood it was the biggest industry in the U.S. So for the government to go against what feeds you, you know, uh, it's like biting the hand that feeds you. So that was pretty strong. And they are based on case control, many of those studies, because they have all these things. A more important thing, strength of the association, dosage, response. So they could measure odds ratio for people smoking just a little bit, smoking a lot, smoking a lot more, and smoke a lot more longer number of years smoking. Okay? So they also could establish biologically the association by mimicking, by using, rubbing uh, the, the bronchia of mice with um, calicrine, which is a substance from tobacco. Okay? And over time, in six months, they'll develop uh, lesions similar to lung cancer. See how that? So that's mean biological plausibility. So again, I'm going against the evidence, epidemiological evidence. That's a long list. Uh, that you'll find in any happy book, but it's still applicable here. So the case control is not the best study, but sometimes it's sufficient if you have many case controls showing the same measure of association. Many of them have more than just one measure of association, has a dose response. Many of them are backed up by studies on animal studies or biological studies show the plausibility of the association. And more important, the mm -hmm. replication with different population or similar population, other studies of case control shows the same result. So you stop believing it. Does it answer your question? I hope yeah, it do. Yeah, yeah. Because, um, reinforcing the findings of the case control. Exactly. So a little bit about case control, mimicking a cohort study. You remember that table, exposure odds ratios. You know you can't do that. You cannot calculate the incidence rate and incidence rate ratio because you don't have the true A plus C and true B plus D. You end up with a risk rate, uh, exposure odds ratio. Not just any odds ratio, I'm calling odds rate, the exposure odds rate, EOR. Okay, among the disease cases, I have the proportion of those who are exposed. Among the control case, uh, control series, I have the proportion who are exposed to whatever risk factor you're interested in. And then I can calculate the odds of exposure among the disease, the odds of exposure among the non disease or the controls, and I divide by two odds and I end up with an exposure odds ratio. AD, that would apply. A plus D divided by B plus C. So that is the fundamental measure of odds ratio. Does it measure relative risk? Uh, let's see. Here, I have the same table. I'm now calling M1. The, is exposure odds ratio a good measure of relative risk? Look at this table. Now, this is a cohort study, folks. Looks like the same table as the case. Control, but it's a cohort. Here, I do have M1 is actually really M1. Is M1 exposed people? I'm making using that to make a difference between A plus B. Okay? But in this table, it's still A plus B. But hang in, hang in there with me. So now I can calculate the different odds here. I can calculate the odds of disease among the exposed. I have M1 exposed people. So A divided by M1 or A divided by A plus B is the number of what? Exposed people who are diseased. That means they develop disease over the period of follow-up. So I can establish the odds of disease among the exposed. And then I have the same for the control, for the unexposed group, not control, the unexposed group, I'm, I'm in a cohort. So I have the odds of disease among the unexposed. If I divide the two odds, I have the risk odds ratio. It's not the exposure odds ratio. It's not the prevalence odds ratio. Risk odds ratio, shown for a cohort. I am certain the M1 is actually exposed people, M2 uh, unexposed people, M0, whatever I call it. So the risk-odds ratio is a good estimation of the relative risk, okay? Uh, if the disease is rare, that's a common thing. I'm going to show later on the case based on nested case control. It's better than that. But here I'm dealing with risk-odds ratio. So the risk-odds ratio, when the disease is rare, what happened when the disease is rare? A plus C is very small relative to M1, right? Let's say in a city, I have thyroid cancer cases. I told you 0.1 per 100,000 in Missouri back in 1992. Well, 0.1 divided by 100,000 is like one by one million, right? So 999,000 people do not have the disease. They didn't develop the disease in a year. Only one out of 900, one million developed. But if I divide one by one million or one by 999,000, it's going to have the same number by 15 decimal places. It's going to give it the same rate. You with me? So when the disease is rare, 
okay? P, B, and D approximate A plus B, right? You follow that? So in the decision rare, what I have is this simple math here. A plus B can be written as A divided by A plus B instead of A by M1 or whatever. So the A approaches zero, B approaches A plus B. So B becomes A plus B. You with me? The B here is A plus B now. Because the 999,000 is the same as 1 million. Because all I want is 999,000 is to be in the denominator so I can divide 1 by 999,000. Which is the same as 1 by 1 million. Okay, so B approximate B plus D. Therefore, A divided by B, that's, the ri that's a risk, right? I'm getting risk, and I get risk ratios here. So once you do the simple math, you can see the real ROR approximates relative risk to the almost perfection. You, know, you don't need to be this example of thyroid cancer. Even if you have something like 100 out of you know, 1,000, okay, it's going to be very close. So your risk odds ratio approximates the relative risk of the risk ratio. Okay, I can hear it. a true example here. I have uh, 1,020 folks here, okay? This is a cohort of 1,050 exposed, 1,020 unexposed. And here are the numbers. So 1,000 is very close to 1,050, isn't it? 1,000 is very close to 1,020. If I divide 50 by 1,050 and 50 by 1,000, it's going to give exactly the same number by three or four or five decimal. Here we go. So the risk ratio and the risk odds ratio are basically the same. One is 258, the other is 2.43. So it's 2.4, 2.5, or 2.6 and 2.4. So that means that people who are in the exposed group are, you know, 2.4 times more likely to develop the disease, or 2.6 more likely. So it's an order of nature very similar. Not identical, not exactly the same, but it's close. So that's what the risk odds ratio does. But does the exposure odds ratio is the same as risk odds ratio? No. One has come from case control, the other one has come from cohort. But here you got a court study, if disease is rare, then A approaches zero, B approaches A plus B, blah, blah, we already know that. But Exposure odds ratio and risk odds ratio are the same. And the guy who proved that is the guy who proved an invented base. <laughs> kind of a theorem. He kind of reinvented that. So the researcher that proved the exposure odds ratio is the same. Uh, let's see exposure odds ratio example here. I have now a case control study. Real numbers here. So I have seven cases and 200 controls. Okay, so that's my case control study. The odds of disease, the exposure for the disease is five over seven. The odds of exposure among the non, the unexposed among the known disease, the disease is 100 by 200, that's 0.25. You got 2.43. This is coming from the same study I had before. The same study was a cohort. Now I say random sample from the cohort end up with these numbers here. Because it was a population-based case control, instead case in population-based control from the same neighborhood that generate the cases. So you end up with some, something like that. So this number here is a true cohort of 2,070 uh, 2, people. Here is from a case control of that 2,070 people, a random sample of cases, instead cases, and a random sample of control. Okay? You end up with similar numbers. Um, then you can find in this lecture here a lot of confidence interval how to calculate for case controls. You read it, ask me a question. I'm going to show you something how these two things are the same. Can you help me here quickly? How the exposure and the risk of ratio are the same? Can you, can you help me here? Um, what? Just so you did it in a second. Exposure odds. What time is it now? Page 25. Oh, that's not it. Give me a second. 
Не видно один пункт. Вот. Uh, I'm just going to start the cohort. Yeah, stop. I'll bring it tomorrow for them. I left it in the... And you should stop by today because of the time. We will go to uh, 12.30. It's 12.30 to finish? The... Yes. Luis, is to finish at 12.30? Yeah. yeah. We have four minutes. Yeah. Okay. Well, folks, uh, are they see me now? Okay. Tomorrow, I'm going to... I'm going to show the math all together. Case control to cohort. Why is this is the same as risk sometimes? How is this related to risk? How the odds ratio and exposure ratio measure each other and does measure the relative risk or risk ratio. Uh, show the math behind it. And I showed the statistical distribution behind all those assumptions. Okay, folks. So we start tomorrow with this more statistical oriented underlying statistical assumptions for case control and cohort study and all the measures that we use. And then in that review, it should be quite clear to you why exposure odds ratio is a very good measure of risk odds ratio, which is an excellent measure of the risk ratio. And then the risk odds ratio is a good measure of the risk ratio. But the best way is always to calculate the true risk ratio, or better, the instance rate ratio, or rate ratio, okay? And I wanna show how that relates and why we need to use some math some statistics in a different way to analyze these two data. Uh, we only have theoretically another two minutes. I'm not gonna spend any time explaining anything. I try to answer some of your questions, asking more questions. The more participation, the better your grades. Okay, I'm gonna give most of the grades just for being there. But I think I'd like to give a good exceptional grade for those who ask the question and make comments. Okay, even if the comment is to say, can you improve on that, can you improve on that? That at the end of the course, I'm gonna do a short survey for you to answer how well you, or was your uptake of this lecture, if you added anything to your uh, arsenal of tools that you have in st statistical and epidemiological methods analysis and design of analytical study. So tomorrow again, we start with the bank, with the math and statistics related to, I promise, I'm, not, I'm gonna show you the calculation already. I'm not gonna let you or do calculation from it because I don't even know how to do it by hand anymore. Maybe 20 years ago, I was good at that, but not anymore. So I need a software to do it for me, but I'll show all digested to you, okay? So you can see how the foundations is all in math, is all in statistics. So you understand these things, okay? Um, I'll see you tomorrow, ask me questions and do read some of the stuff I gave it to you. You'll see the relationship at the end of this course. By the way, I have more lectures that I prepare for you. It's all yours. I'm gonna organize with, uh, Fred and Louise and Secrets that you should study them. I'm doing more or less the secret. I'm skipping a lot of lectures, okay? Because this is a course that's intensive all day long for five days. I'm only giving half a day to you. There'll be a max of two, three lectures per day. Should be five, six. Uh, and there's a lot of material and homeworks. I'm not gonna give you homework, but ask question, I'll answer, and that's at your numbers, okay? See you tomorrow. Take care. Thank you. How are you turning this off? Eu peço para todo mundo que anotem possíveis dúvidas, leiam o material que foi passado para vocês. E amanhã, quando a gente for começar, a gente abre com um espaço para dúvidas e questões surgidas no dia de hoje. Tá? Tá bom. Só queria avisar que eu vou pôr essas. Elas têm acesso a esse slide, a Blackbird? Não, não tem. Onde você... Mande, mande para todos eles, todas essas lectures. Mandar já todas as lectures, o curso inteiro, para eles já terem na mão, já estudarem com as lectures. Vou mandar ah, então, hoje... Então, tarde, vocês vão receber esses slides. Tem a lista de... de, de... Passa o link para eles, para os códigos. Não quero entender isso, não. Eu tenho. Pode? Ah, não, tá. Então, vou me mostrar. Então, a gente vai tentar mandar... Uh, os slides, pelo menos da, da aula de hoje, para vocês reverem e, e confrontarem com as referências para vir com dúvidas bem uh, claras amanhã, antes da gente começar o segundo tópico, tá bom?
Obrigado pela presença de todos. Vamos desligar aqui, então. Até amanhã. Eu acho que precisa ter um minuto. Eu...